um, green stars. Green stars. So what do we know about green stars? Green stars is level one in the syllabus. We just need a very basic understanding. So y'all don't spend all your study time on the rest of unit 10, okay? We're gonna go through it pretty quickly. You guys look it over, um, but know that there's other important things in unit 10 to focus on. So we are gonna finish up unit 10. And the rest of unit 10, we're gonna call alternative land conveyances. So not all property is a traditional sale. And there are some other ways that buyers and sellers can convey property. And we're just gonna talk about a few in the rest of unit 10. Uh, there are others, of course, but we're gonna talk about just a few. And the first alternative land conveyance that we have is something called an installment land contract. In an installment land contract, the buyer is paying the seller for the, the purchase price. The buyer is paying the seller, but they are not paying the seller in one lump sum. They are paying the seller in installments. So they're basically making payments. Is it layaway kind of? <laughs> so they're basically making payments on the property. Um, so the installment land contract, the buyer has possession. The buyer has something called equitable title, which means they have the right to live there. They have the right to use the property, the right to profit from the property. We're going to talk more about equitable title in unit 14. The seller keeps the deed, though. The seller keeps the deed in their name until that last payment is made. So what's the collateral that the seller has over the buyer? They have the deed. So we'll talk about what happens in the buyer default uh, in just a second. So the buyer's paying the seller in installments and when the last payment is made, then the buyer gets the deed. Then they get the title to the property. Also, when we get into 14, we're gonna talk about seller financing. The difference in seller financing and installment land contract is when the deed changes hands. So we'll learn in seller financing that the deed changes hands at closing, the buyer pays the seller. Installment land contract, we go to closing, buyer pays the seller, and then the buyer gets the deed when the last payment is made. Because this type of arrangement uses a sales and the seller acts as the financing instrument, we cannot use our standard forms when we have this situation. I don't have a pre-printed form for this scenario. And if we don't have a pre-printed form for a situation, what do we do? You can even show me. What do we do? Call your attorney, okay? If we don't have a pre-printed form, then we have to call the attorney and have them draft something up. So let's look at an example together and then we'll talk a little bit more about the benefits for each buyer and seller in these situations. So the buyer agrees to purchase real property and to pay the seller the sum of 105,000 in the following manner. He's gonna deliver 5,000 at the execution of the contract with the balance of 100,000 together with interest at a rate of 12% until paid in full. <laughs> Said principal and interest shall be payable in 240 installments of not less than this amount per month beginning on this date. So they, they come to this agreement. 12% is not set in stone. 240 installment payments not set in stone, right? This is all negotiable points between buyer and seller on how they wanna proceed. So let's talk about some advantages and disadvantages for each party. The seller advantages, well, they still own the property. They still have the deed in their name. So they may be eligible for some tax benefits. Have them call their accountant. For the seller, this might make a hard to sell property more desirable. Uh, maybe you have a property that needs lots and lots and lots of work. And it takes somebody that knows what they're doing with a toolbox and maybe that buyer knows what they're doing with the toolbox. So maybe we can make an arrangement. Maybe they can work something out that way, for example. Probably the biggest advantage to the sellers, they get to keep the legal title. They keep the deed. So in the buyer default, the seller still has the property. They got to get the buyer out, which we'll talk about in just a second, but they still have the title. 
The biggest disadvantage to the seller, it's low down payment up front. And, you know, the seller's going to get their money. They're just not going to get it in one lump sum. It might be spread out over two years or 20 years or whatever. So if the seller needs to sell and get cash now, this may not be an option for them. But if the seller's okay with receiving X amount over time, Some pluses and minuses for the buyer, buyer advantages and disadvantages. This could be a good option for the buyer if they have poor credit. Uh, maybe for whatever reason, maybe they had a slew of medical bills in their history and it messed up their credit a little bit. And now they can't get a home loan. So this might be a good option for the buyer if they have poor credit. While the buyer doesn't own the property, excuse me, while the buyer doesn't have the deed, they still are the ones that get to pay the taxes. So they too may be able to have tax advantages. Again, have them call their accountant. The biggest disadvantage for the buyer is in the event of the buyer's default. If the buyer stops making that installment payment, um, the rules say, and this is just FYI, the rules say that in the event of the buyer's default, the seller has to give them 30 days to catch up. And if they can't come up with the whole note due in 30 days, then the seller can kick them out. They can evict them. We're gonna talk about the eviction process in unit 11. When we talk about tenants and landlords. If the buyer defaults and can't come up with the whole note due, they lose whatever money they've already paid. The seller doesn't have to give them their money back. Kind of like the bank, isn't it? Kind of like if you foreclose with Bank of America. If you go to foreclosure, is Bank of America going to reimburse you for the money you already paid them? No. So again, the seller's just pretty much acting as the lending institution. The buyer's paying the seller. And the buyer doesn't own the property yet. So they cannot use the property's collateral. Again, the deed is still in the seller's name. A uh, question came in, is this a rent to own? It absolutely could be if the parties agree to that arrangement. So you could have a rent to own where some or all of the rent is considered a payment. Again, we're going to have an attorney draft this up though, right? Because we don't have a pre-printed form for this. So let me ask you guys, let's pretend that you're the listing agent. You have a property for sale and you get an offer from a buyer to do an installment land contract, do you have to present this to your seller? And I'm seeing heads shake yes. Why? Because we present what offers? All offers. And an offer to do an installment land contract is an offer. So you get an offer in, best advice you can give your seller is to talk to their attorney. Questions on an installment land contract. The other, or I should say another alternative land conveyance we have is something called an option to purchase. Remember when we started unit nine, we said contracts are either bilateral or unilateral. And we said most everything we do is a bilateral. How many sides have to perform in a bilateral contract? How many sides have to perform in a bilateral contract? Two, two parties have to perform. So how many do you think have to perform in a unilateral contract? Just one. To my knowledge, this is our example of a unilateral contract in real estate. There may be others, but this is the one I'm aware of. With an option to purchase, the buyer has not promised to buy. The buyer has simply asked for the option to decide if they want to purchase. At the end of the option period, the buyer either buys or they don't. They're not under contract, they've made no promises, they've just asked for time to decide if they wanna buy. 
The only promise made in an option to purchase is a promise from the seller. The seller promises the buyer that they won't sell their property to anybody else during this option period. Not only is this in writing, but it's also recorded to prevent the shady seller from selling it from out from underneath the buyer is exploring their option. So here's the deal. Buyer and seller come together and agree to all the terms. Basically the buyer saying, if I decide to buy, these are the terms that I'm gonna buy. If, if I decide to buy, this is the purchase price. These are the dates. This is how, da, 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 how we're gonna do it. We come to an agreement. Again, at the end of the option, the buyer either buys or they don't. You may be sitting there asking yourself, what in the world would make a seller agree to do this? What in the world would make a seller agree not to sell their house to anybody else for two weeks or two months or two years, however long we agree to? And the answer to that is a very healthy option fee. In an option, there are two forms of consideration. The sales price that we agreed on when we entered into the option, and then the option fee that is paid directly to the seller. If the buyer decides to buy, then it's credited back to them at closing. If they don't, then the seller keeps it. Kind of sounds like due diligence a little bit, doesn't it? Again, the difference is the buyer hasn't, hasn't agreed to buy. That's the difference in an option and a due diligence. The buyer has not agreed to buy. They've just requested an option period of time. It's all negotiable to decide if they want to buy or not. They're basically locking the property down. I don't have a form for this. We do not have a pre-printed form for this scenario. So what are we going to do if this situation comes up? Call your attorney or have your buyers and sellers call their attorney, bless you, to get something, <laughs> to get something. <laughs> um, let's say you have a property listed for sale and you get an offer to do an option to purchase. Do you have to present this to your seller? And the answer is yes, because we present what offers to our sellers? All of them. So if it's an option to purchase, again, maybe it's two weeks, maybe it's two days, maybe it's two months, maybe it's two years. We present this to the seller. Questions on the option to purchase. Let me ask you guys this, an installment land contract, option to purchase. An offer is made, does the seller have to accept it? When an offer is made, doesn't the seller have three choices? So if they get the offer to do an option or they get the offer to do an installment land contract, they can, want to do it together, accept it, reject it. An offer is an offer is an offer. And that's where I think these alternative land conveyances get cloudy in our minds because we think it's something different than standard offer to purchase and contract, but an offer is an offer is an offer. Questions on this one? Good morning. The other, or the last alternative land conveyance that we have that we're gonna talk about is something called a preemptive right. And there are two types of preemptive rights. First off, let's talk about what a preemptive right is. A preemptive right is just a contractual right to be the first one to acquire property. Maybe the seller doesn't wanna sell right now. Maybe the buyer doesn't wanna buy right now. But if we have a preemptive right, we have contractual agreement that when you are ready to sell or I am ready to buy, we're legally bound to each other for you to be first. You're preemptive. You're above the others. The first type of a preemptive right is called a right of first refusal. In a right of first refusal, 
the owner has not promised to sell. The owner has just said, if I decide to sell and I get a legit contract from somebody else, the preemptive right says that the seller has to go to the contracting party first. Maybe I don't wanna sell just yet, but if I ever get a contract in my hand, I'm legally bound to come to you first. You have a preemptive right. The party has the chance to match or beat the bona fide offer. You're contractually obligated to go to this person first and give them the opportunity to beat or match. Maybe a good example of this, maybe, um, let me think it through for a second. Maybe you live next door to a vacant corner lot and you don't want to buy the vacant corner lot. You have no interest in it. But maybe you don't want Dollar General to buy the vacant corner lot either. So you could do a right of first refusal when Dollar General makes an offer to purchase that vacant corner lot, the owner has to come to you first and give you the chance to decide. So maybe you don't want to sell, maybe you don't want to buy, but before it moves, you want somebody else to have that opportunity. This can be pretty common in leases too. The tenant's been there for how many years? Two years, 20 years? Maybe the seller doesn't want to sell yet, but the tenant really, really wants to buy. So we could em enter into a right of first refusal. But when the landlord is ready to sell, they have to go to the tenant first, or when the landlord gets an offer, excuse me, when the landlord gets an offer, they have to go to the tenant first. The other preemptive right that we have is called a right of first opportunity to purchase. So in a right of first opportunity to purchase, there is no contract. The seller doesn't want it to sell now, but if they ever decide to sell at any point in the future, they have to go to this contracting party first. No contract to match, no contract in hand. It's just if the seller ever decides to sell. We're gonna agree to all the terms in this one ahead of time. I don't wanna sell you my property now, but if I ever decide to sell, I will sell it to you for X amount. Inflation can hurt this one, can it? What if you entered into a right of first opportunity to purchase even five years ago? Five years ago, did we dream what appreciation was gonna do? How much values were gonna go up? So this one could hurt either party. Once again, I do not have pre-printed forms for either of these preemptive rights. So what are we gonna do? Call our attorney. If you have a listing for sale, you get an offer to do a preemptive right, are you gonna present it to the seller? Yes, because we present what offers? All of them. Let's do a quick side-by-side -side comparison of these two. Again, what we've already talked about, but just so we can see it back to back. I hope what you heard from this section is call your attorney and present all offers. <laughs> it's kind of the theme here. <laughs> Questions? Told you that wouldn't take us long. So unit 10, the key terms, again, you guys, the star of unit 10 is our standard offer to purchase and contract. 
So there's some key terms on page 269. That key point review. I like the key point review, kind of like Cliff's notes. Even use the key point review as a checklist. You go through the key point review. Do you know this, this, and this? Ooh, I don't know that. Maybe I should go back into unit 10 and review it. So use it as a, as a checklist. And then the student quiz. And I feel the need to say, don't let the key point review take over you reading the unit. This isn't in, in place of reading the unit. This is to help you summarize the unit. I just felt the need to say that all of a sudden. Okay. And then the student quiz <laughs> on pages 304 to 307. Before we continue, I want to have just a brief, I'll put your pencils down for a second. Just, just put your pencils down for a second. I want to have a conversation, um, make sure we understand communicating and communicating acceptance and when that communication of acceptance crosses the line. So in unit 10, we talked about offer and acceptance, also known as mutual assent, also known as meeting of the minds. It's another one of those fun things that have three different things that mean the same thing. Two parties have to come together and agree to enter into a contract together. An offer is made, it's considered, and it's eventually accepted and becomes a contract. And we talked about this magic moment in time and when it goes from being an offer to a contract. And that magic moment in time, I need two things to happen, don't I? The last offeree has to accept it. The last receivee has to accept it. And for your test, by acceptance, what do we know when we see accept? What do we know? It's been, it's been signed. So the last offeree accepts it. And then communication of acceptance must cross the line. The person making the offer has to know that their offer has been accepted. Everybody with me? So what we've been talking about so far in unit 10 is pretty much this scenario. We've been talking about two firms, one firm, one agent working with the buyer who more often than not, not always, is the offer or, and then another firm working with the seller who more often than not is the offeree. So this is the scenario that we've been using uh, up to this point. What if the firm or the agent's roles are different? And I wanna make sure we understand what happens to the line when it's an in-house transaction. Remember two different firms is a co-broke, right? You got two firms working together to bring this buyer and seller together. They're brokeraging the deal. But what happens to the line when we move it in-house? And I don't know that you're gonna be tested on this per se. I, I almost guarantee you, that's a strong word, isn't it? I can almost promise you that if you see a test question, it's gonna be this scenario. Two firms co-brokering the deal. But I think now that we have talked about agency and we have talked about communicating acceptance, I think it may help us to have a conversation just a second about what happens to the line. What if it's an in-house transaction? What if it's dual agency? What do you think happens to the line? Who represents the seller? Who represents the buyer? How many firms? In dual agency, just one. So the line in communicating acceptance, where'd it go? There is no line. We don't have a wall to cross. Because remember, when we talked about dual agency, we said the firm is the line. And now when we're communicating acceptance, I have no line to cross. Because the firm is representing, maybe you have two agents, Maybe you just have one. But when it comes to communicating acceptance, once the seller notifies their agent, i.e. their firm, that they've accepted, we're basically under contract, aren't we? Because there is no line to cross.
what happens then in dual agency? I'm sorry, designated dual agency. Dual agency, there is no line. Designated dual agency, the line comes back. Because now you have two agents of the firm representing one representing the buyer and another representing the seller. You guys see how this kind of see where we're, again, what are you gonna be tested on? What we've been talking about up to this point. But you see how that line of communication can change depending on our role? Our being the firm. Remember you guys, it's not your relationship. It's not your buyer, it's not your seller. Every single one of us in this industry walk around talking about my buyer and my seller. And you will too, I promise. But you need to remember that it's not yours. So in designated, one agent has been kicked off the wall, designated to work exclusively with the buyer. A different agent of the firm has been kicked off the wall and designated to work exclusively with the seller. These two now proceed as if there's a wall between them. These two proceed, they might as well be with two different firms. So this is our designated, and, and again, look at where the firm and all the other agents are. They're still straddling that line, aren't they? They're still straddling that wall. What if the buyer is unrepresented and the agent is a seller subagent? If the agent is a seller subagent, what side of the line do you think they're on? Sellers, subagent. What side do you think they're on? They're on the side of the seller side, right? In seller subagency, the buyer has chose to go unrepresented. The buyer has said, I don't need anybody to stand over here on this side of the line with me. I want to stand over here by myself. So now you have the firm and the agent representing the seller. And then you have the person working with, not for, but with the buyer. This person is the one that gets to communicate with the buyer. But they are assisting their seller to get through the transaction. Why are they helping this buyer? because it's in the best interest of the seller. The buyer's the customer. So the buyer makes an offer, seller's the offeree. I don't have that here, but the seller's the offeree. The buyer says, yeah, 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 I accept. They tell the person that they're working with that they accept, I'm sorry, that they make the offer, the buyer makes the offer, I'm sorry. They communicate with the seller. The seller says, I accept, the seller accepts. They tell their agent, their agent tells the seller sub-agent, am I under contract yet? We got one more step, don't we? We need to notify that unrepresented buyer. This is what it means to be unrepresented. What's that little children's rhyme, the cheese stands alone? Y'all remember something like that? The buyer stands alone. If the buyer choose to go unrepresented, they choose to stand alone. So again, I, 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 I can almost promise you, your exams, I know for mine, um, probably for your state exam, the scenario you're gonna see, uh-oh, you guys here? Okay, all right. The scenario you're gonna see is this, you have two firms co-brokering the transaction. But I, I think having an understanding of how our role changes and how that communication changes helps prepare you. Questions or comments on that? I I'm a big, idea. big fan of drawing the line. Draw it, yeah. In the scenario that we just talked about, um, what if the buyer becomes the offeree? Then the seller sub agent will be on his side of the line? Nope. He's still over here alone because he chose to be alone. Okay. Right. So now we the seller does a counter, the roles reverse, the buyer's the offeree, the buyer accepts, 
which means they have signed. They call the agent that they're working with. We're in a contract, aren't we? Because once okay. the buyer calls, uh-huh, once the buyer calls that person and says, I accept, we've crossed the line, haven't we? So remember in a counteroffer, those roles reverse. The last offeree has to accept, which means sign, and then communication has to cross the line. Good question. Thank you. I hope this helped. If this hurt, please ignore everything I just said. I don't want to confuse anybody. The last thing I want to do. So if this is not helpful at all, just erase it and go on with your life. <laughs> but maybe, maybe this can help sum up, again, our role, dual agency, buyer's agent, and that communicating of acceptance. And that's what I refer to as the line. Communicating acceptance so we all know we're under contract. Yes, ma'am. Is the seller sub agent, is that common? Um, sure. I mean, I don't know how, I can't give you numbers. I don't know how often it happens, but sure. Especially you guys in this market, who's buying all the homes in this market? Investors, let me rephrase that. Cash investors, they don't want representation. They don't want, they just need somebody. They, they just need somebody to, to let them in the house. You know, they, they, don't, they, they don't need this. They know what they're doing. They're investors. They do this for a living. So I'd say in this market, it's probably more common than what I've ever seen it. And we get out of this market and we'll see less and less of it because now the investors own all the property and they're going to rent everything. <laughs> so the next market is going to be real interesting as is the market after that and the market after that. Other questions or comments? All right. One more thing. I swear I'm almost done with unit 10. Just one more thing. Just one more thing. One more thing I want to um, just have, just, just show you guys. We talked the other day about commonly used addenda and amendment. And all those that we talked about are in here. So again, you guys just need a basic understanding of what the addenda does. Uh, so for example, we talked about the additional provisions addendum. And we talked about you know, the various things that this form offers us. So I just have the forms in here if it helps you have a basic understanding of it. Focus on what we talked about, focus what's in the book. I have these here for your reference. Um, Here's our response to buyer's offer that we talked about that we mentioned, backup contract addendum, et cetera. The other thing that I wanna mention that we didn't say much about, you guys remind me first off in a chat, in, or uh, yeah, what an amendment does. What does an amendment do? Yep. An amendment is a change. So if we are using the agreement to amend the contract, first off, look at your look at your words. Does this say offer or does this say contract? So if we're making a change to the contract, we're already under contract, aren't we? We've moved past the offer. Everything is signed, communication crossed the line. We are under contract. And now this form allows us to change something. We're entering into round two of negotiations. Why? Because the parties can do whatever they want to. And if they wake up tomorrow and want to renegotiate something, then we enter into round two. So the agreement to amend the contract, and you'll notice here, we have pre-printed verbiage. What do we want to amend? Are we changing the purchase price? Are we changing the earnest money? Uh, are we changing the due diligence fee or the due diligence period? Are we changing the settlement date? And are, or are we changing seller paid expenses? So remember we can, when it comes to repair negotiations, 
maybe it doesn't have to be the agreement to do repairs. Maybe we can do something in lieu of repairs. Maybe the seller says, I'll tell you what, our original contract said I was gonna pay $0 towards your closing costs. But the buyer found a whole bunch of electrical issues. Seller says, I don't want to deal with that. So in lieu of repairs, let me offer to pay, and I'm just making a number up, $2,000 towards your uh, closing costs. That's $2,000 less dollars that the buyer has to bring to closing. So now they have that money in their pocket that they can handle the electrical repairs after it, after it closes. So this form is used anytime we change a contract, amend a contract. And it's so important that we know that even though we're under contract, anything is still negotiable. Part of our job, I, I heard this once when I first got into sales and it summed it up. Part of our job is to help our buyers and sellers come up with creative solutions. Maybe it's not doing electrical. Maybe it is the seller paying closing costs. Maybe it's reducing the purchase price. The parties can do whatever they agree to. And remember, we compared an amendment to an, ad an addendum. An addendum adds to. When you guys see addendum, I want you to see the word add. So an addendum and an amendment. Again, these are here. I'm in the unit 10 material. And they're all lumped together under commonly used addenda and amendments. Don't need to study the forms. Just have a basic understanding of what the forms do. Fair enough. What questions do I have on that? Okay. Y'all want a cahoot? Y'all want a cahoot? Yeah, get your phones. I'll get you a game pen. This cahoot is on units nine and 10. Nine and 10 are our contract units. So you either have the website, kahoot.it, you downloaded the app. If you do the website or the app, you need a game pen or you can go to the QR code. Let's scan the QR code. You put in your name, I'm good with nicknames. Are those little ghosts? <laughs> so purse or a briefcase, LOL. <laughs> Again, this Kahoot is units nine and 10. And if you don't wanna play on your phone, please just play in your mind. Don't let your phone go to sleep because you'll get, it's like you get kicked out, wake your phone back up. Is anybody in that wants to play? Come once, going twice. All right. Nine and 10 Kahoot, contract Kahoot. Avoid 
contract is one that is Ten seconds. A void contract is one that is not legally enforceable. Remember, there's only two types of contracts. They're either valid or void. Valid means they'll stand up in front of a court of law, in front of a judge. Void means you're missing an essential element. Void means you never had a contract to begin with because something's missing. A valid contract can become voidable by how many of the parties? Just by one. A valid contract becomes voidable by one of the parties. A void contract, you never had a contract to begin with. So let's see. Devin got it right the fastest, followed by Becca, then Dee, Val Rose, and Lily. Question number two. <clears throat> the essential elements of any type of contract include all the following except. Ten seconds. The essential element of any type of contract include all the following except agency disclosure. Agency disclosure is not a contract. Agency disclosure does not create agency. Agency disclosure is our opportunity to do what? Disclose our status. Tell the consumer, careful what you tell me, this is who I represent, and most importantly, I don't owe you confidentiality if and until you decide to hire. Um, so what are our essential elements? Well, we have our offer and acceptance, our meeting of the minds uh, that has to be by legally competent parties. There has to be some form of consideration. Guys, remember, consideration is the problem topic with essential elements of a contract. So make sure you highlight that and circle it twice, okay? Consideration is just something of value. Typically with consideration in a contract, what are, we, what are we referring to? Typically, what's that thing of value? Money, money, right? But it's something of value. Is free rent something of value? Yeah. Um, the fourth essential element, uh, competent parties, consideration, offer, and acceptance, it has to be for a legal purpose. You can't have a legally binding contract for an illegal purpose. So agency disclosure was the, was the accept in this one. Questions on this one. So we got... Val Rose jumped up, Lily jumped up, Marie jumped up, Sav jumped up, and Mesh jumped up. And our little ghost is our highest climber, up seven places. Question number three. The law requiring real estate contracts be in writing to be enforceable is the... Ten seconds. The law requiring to be in writing, be enforceable. Here we go. It's the statute of frauds. What's the Connor Act? What's the Connor Act say? Somebody unmute yourself and tell me. Connor record. says what? Record. Connor says you have to record. Statute of fraud says you have to put it in writing. Make flashcards on that. Questions on this one? Let's 
So we got Val Rose stayed up there, Sav climbed up, Cassie Mesh, Becca came back up. JJ is our highest climber this round, up seven places. Question number four. If the seller makes a counter offer, the prospective buyer is. Ten seconds. If the seller makes a counter offer, the prospective buyer is here we go, relieved of all offer obligations. Why? Counter offer is what? A rejection. The roles reverse. Seller makes a counter offer. They're making a brand new offer to the buyer. The buyer has three choices. They can accept it reject it or counter it. Nobody's bound to anything in a counter offer. The new offeree has three choices to make. Questions on this one. So we got Sav, Valrose, Cassie, Mesh, Becca, and our little Huggy, happy face down here, whatever that is. <laughs> you got an answer streak of three, you're on fire this round. Question number five, to rescind a contract, one is. Ten seconds. To rescind a contract, one is canceling it. If you're rescinding it, you're taking it back. If you're rescinding it, you're taking it back. If you put down any deposits, you'll get your money back. We talked about um, buyers going under contract in a timeshare. Have how many days to rescind? Five in a timeshare. How many days do buyers have of a new condominium construction? Seven. When you rescind a contract, you cancel it, you take it back. You put down any deposits, you get your money back. Both parties go about their business as if it would never happen. If you're changing a contract, you're doing what? A change to a contract is an, an amendment. Okay, tricky, tricky. Sav staying on top on fire this round. Val Rose, Casey climbed up. Mish, a little happy face. Happy huggy face. To assign a contract for the sale of real property is to. Ten seconds. To assign a contract, one is transferring one's rights and responsibilities. If you assign a contract, all the terms stay the same. The only thing that changes is what? The name of one of the parties. You're assigning your duties and obligations and liabilities to somebody else. All the terms stay the same. Monies, dates, all those agreed upon terms stay the same. Whether or not a contract is assignable has to be spelled out in the contract. Whether or not a contract can be assignable has to be spelled out in the contract. So you're transferring your right and responsibilities. So we got Val Rose back up. Mish is on fire this round. 
Aaron climbed up, happy huggy face, and our ghost came back up. Last one. In the event of seller breach, the buyer can sue the seller and force them to sell. This is called Ten seconds. Seller breaches, buyer sues, a force on a sale. This is called specific performance. The judge can make the seller perform. If the judge makes the seller perform, then they're going to make the seller sell. Consequential damages is one of our money damages, one of our money remedies. We talked about compensatory damages, consequential damages, and liquidated damages. Questions on this one? All right, the big reveal. Third place is a little ghost. We're pretty happy too. That's good. Second place is Aaron. And our first place winner, this Kahoot, is Happy Huggy Face. You guys will have to tell me who you are in a, in a chat so I can. <laughs> Yay. Okay. <laughs> oh, and I missed the runners up. I'm sorry. I didn't get to see who fourth and fifth place runners up. <laughs> questions all right guys before we take a break i just got a couple things i'd like to say um we're moving on from agency and contracts i i have to because we still got other stuff to cover we're four weeks away okay the the big bulk of the class came from seven eight nine and ten so now we're going to start picking up the pace a bit right because we're not going to see as many red stars we are going to see red stars but we're not going to see as many um, remember, you guys, I, I sat down and did the math once. 40% of your exam comes from 7, 8, 9, and 10. So even though we're moving on, I need you guys to keep going back and reviewing agency. I need you guys to keep going back and reviewing contracts. Everybody with me? Everybody agree to do that? I also have a, I have a favor from you guys. I've never asked this before, so I'm interested in what kind of response I'm going to get. At some point this weekend, between now and next Tuesday morning, when you're studying, I'd like to hear from you guys. Why well, let's do a halfway check. Send me a text, send me an email, tell me how you're doing, tell me how things are going, tell me if there's something you're struggling with, tell me where you are right now. I can't make you do it, obviously. This is just me requesting. Um, but I'm just kind of curious to hear from you guys. Obviously, going to Zoom, we have a disconnect. And I'm trying to fill that, that void. So if you guys would, and, and guys, remember, there's 46 of you and one of me. So I may not get back to you immediately. But I just, I'd like to do a midterm check-in, if, if we want to call it that. Um, if you haven't done your beginning of class introduction yet, <laughs> this is a good opportunity to do that as well. So if I didn't get your selfie with your with your textbook. Um, so as we go on to break, I'm going to go ahead and put my phone number and email in the chat again. And uh, I just after class, please don't do it during class. I would consider that a distraction. But after class, somewhere between now and next Tuesday, let me just hear from you. Does that sound OK? All right, so I'll put my number and email in the chat. Um, let's take 10. When we come back, we're gonna talk about the process to apply for your license and apply for your state exam. So let's take 10.
All right. We back. So I am taking attendance. And before we jump into um, 14, <clears throat> we need to talk just for a minute about the process of getting, you gotta apply for your license, you gotta apply to take your state exam, okay? In Learn Test Pass, in the welcome section, there's a little booklet called Real Estate Licensing in North Carolina. Remember how I say if we can make an acronym out of anything in this industry, we will. So we more often refer to this booklet as the Relink, Real Estate Licensing in North Carolina, also known as the Relink. Everybody good if I call it Relink going forward? We know what I'm talking about, Real Estate Licensing in North Carolina. This is the booklet from the North Carolina Real Estate Commission to assist you guys in the process of getting your license. So the question always comes in, I passed Julie's class, yay! Now what the heck do I do? And this booklet answers that question. First off, I need everybody to understand that when you pass my class, you leave the hands of Carolina School of Real Estate and you go into the hands of the North Carolina Real Estate Commission. Okay, the process is the same for everybody across the state. Feel free to call Lane and I for help if you have questions, but where do you think Lane and I are getting our answers? Where do you think Lane and I are getting the information that we're giving to you? This booklet. So if you call us and hear her pages rustling, <laughs> this is us going through this book. Everything you need is right here. I have highlighted uh, things of importance. I think are important about the process. You guys also got this booklet and an email from Lane when you first registered for this class. So you have it in Learn Test Pass. The current will always be here. I don't know what version you got from Lane. This thing updates. The current version is last May, 2021. I think it's important that you guys look through this whole booklet because it helps you once you pass my class, what to do next. But there's also some testing points in here too some things that'll help you get ready for your exams. How many of you guys have, have looked at it since you got your couple of you? Good, 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 good. So I'm just gonna focus on the state exam part of it and everybody please, there's, okay, let me back up for a second, get ahead of myself. Is everybody good? Do I have everybody's understanding that there are two tests that stand between you and your real estate license? Two, there's mine and when you pass mine, then you go on and take the state exam. Everybody good so far? Okay. This conversation is solely on the state exam part of it. I will open up questions in just a second for my exam, but let's just focus on one thing at a time. Can we do that for a minute? So this conversation is solely on your state exam. I passed Julie's test, now what do I do? And you guys are looking through this, but I just want to point out a few things. And the first thing, probably the most important thing that I want to make sure you guys understand is on page seven, there is the application process. Everybody hear me when I say this is a process and it has to be done in a certain order. What order does it have to be done in? It spells it out for you right here. Step one, step two, step three. You guys, let's make this big so we can see it, huh? There we go. There we go, is that better? You guys are all currently in the process of completing step one. So step one is to pass my class, my end of class exam. Once you complete the class, once you pass my end of class exam, and again, we'll talk about that in just a second. You will then submit um, a license application. I'll show you in just a second where you can start the process, where you can start filling in your application and everything you need to know. Once you submit 
your application. The real estate commission will consider it, they'll review it. And upon approval, you will get from the real estate commission a notice of exam eligibility. Once you get the notice of exam eligibility, then you contact the testing center to schedule your state exam. The Real Estate Commission uses the testing center known as PSI. There are locations all over the state of North Carolina. I don't know where all they're located. They'll let you know. You can go to their website today if you want to after class and see where their locations are. You can also do it online. I'll talk more about that in just a second. You cannot contact PSI to schedule until you get the notice of exam eligibility from the Real Estate Commission. Okay, step one, step two, step three, et cetera. Once you contact PSI, they offer testing. Again, you can go online. You can do it from the comfort of your own home. I'll talk more about that. Um, you can go in the morning. You can go in the evening. You can go on the weekends. You know, they're open and they're flexible. PSI is a testing center, which means they offer exams. You might not be in there with other real estate people. There might be um, CNAs in their take or future CNAs taking their exam, right? It's, they offer professional testing. Uh, if you pass, remember your state exam consists of two sections. If you pass, you get your real estate license. If you don't pass either section, let's just say you pass the national and you fail the state, you only have to go back to PSI and retake the section that you failed. So once you pass a section, you're in, you're good. You have six months to complete and pass both sections. If you don't pass both sections within six months, you have to submit another application to the Real Estate Commission. You don't have to come back and take pre-licensing, but you do have to submit, start with step two, submit another, so, okay, so six months, don't submit your application until you're ready. And this is why we're having this conversation now. I understand you cannot submit your application until you finish our test, but some of you may wanna get that application started. So the day you do pass my test, you can send that thing in and get it going. Some of you may wanna wait uh, and do your application when you pass my test. I can't answer that for you. That's for you guys, what you guys wanna do. So you submit your application. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, you get the notice of exam eligibility from the Real Estate Commission, and then you contact PSI Testing Center. Every single time you go to PSI, whether you're taking both sections or just one, every single time you go to PSI, it's 156 bucks. So let me help you save your wallet. You guys don't go to PSI until you're ready. If you feel, if you pass my exam and you feel like you had a lucky day, you may want to wait. You with me? I'd run out and buy a lottery ticket that day, but don't submit until you're ready because it's going to cost you 156 bucks every single time that you go, whether you're doing one section or two. Um, this talks about the six months. When you pass my exam, you get a certificate from Lane. That certificate is good for three years. So you can keep replying your six months for up to three years. Does that make sense? Each application is good for six months. You can do that for six months, three years from the day you complete the class. If you wait longer than three, y'all don't take three years to go to PSI. Things change and you forgot everything in three years, I promise. But if you don't go to PSI within three years, <clears throat> that's when you have to come back and see me. So there's your carrot. I wanna see you guys in post-licensing, okay? So once you take pre once, don't take it again. Don't make yourself come back. So you got three years. Um, you'll submit your application online. I'll show you again in where a second where you can, where you can find that. Um, here's step-by-step, step. step-by-step, you guys. How you submit your application, step-by-step uh, step about things that they're gonna need. I do know, or I have heard that they want like your previous seven years of addresses. 
So if you moved around a lot in the last seven years, that may be something you want to start getting together. So when you're ready, you have all that. Again, I'll show you all that in just a second. Um, with your application, you're required to submit a background, a criminal background check. They're going to do a search. Um, Real Estate Commission will only require, will only accept a background check from this company. This is part of your online application. So you don't need this contact information once you get into your application. Again, this is only good for six months. So if you order your background check today and it comes back next week, your six month clock has started and you haven't even finished the class yet. So while I think you guys may want to start your application, I suggest waiting until closer to time to submit for your background check. Because once it comes back, that six month clock starts. And when that's over, you have to order another background check. They go back roughly seven years. If you have a blemish in your past, it doesn't mean you're going to be denied a real estate license. They take every application, they review every single application, all of them one at a time. So just because you have a blemish doesn't mean it's automatically not going to get a license. Um, I think they ask you about things past over seven years. And, and the reason I hesitate when I say this, y'all don't understand, when I got my license, we were still paper and snail mail. So this process is new to me. You guys are getting, I see more than what I've ever seen. And I think when you submit you, your background check, you have to tell them, like fess up to it. And I've had students tell me that they have found stuff like a traffic violation from 1997. So even though this says seven years, I suggest you just fess up to everything because somehow they find it. I don't know how, I, I don't know how, but somehow yeah, I had a student call, I got a traffic to 1997 and she got her license. I don't want you to think that she was denied, but they, it, it flagged her report. They had to review it and make sure that her traffic violation, how long ago was 1997? I, I don't know either, but it was more than seven years ago, right? So that's my suggestion is that you fess up uh, for anything you've had. Again, I'll show you in just a second where to start that. If you are concerned about your past, don't call Lane and I and tell us what you did. I, I can't, I'm not the commission. And I can't give you a decision. So all I can say is, wow, that's interesting. Contact the commission. So please don't call Lane and I. We don't, you know, la, 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 right? So don't call us. But if you do have a blemish, they're going to look for character issues. This tells you everything that they're going to look for. And one thing you may want to consider doing is something called a petition for a predetermination. They can approve your background check if you're concerned about your history they can approve your background check before you submit your application. So this walks you through that process. So background check is part of your application. When you're submitting your application, you've already gotten your background check back. Um, if you've only lived in North Carolina the last seven years, I think, please don't hold me to this, but I think it's about 30 bucks for the background check and you should have it back within a week. If you've lived in other states or other countries in the last seven years, it's gonna be more expensive and it's gonna take it longer to get back. How much more expensive and how much longer? I can't answer that because all states are different. Okay, so just know if you have something other than North Carolina in the last seven years, it's gonna take you longer. Um, they even tell us, um, they specifically say that states like, for example, New York are notorious for being expensive and taking longer. So if you have New York in your history in the last seven years, just know that you got to wait that extra time. So background check is part of your application. Cannot submit your application until you have everything, and that does include the background check. Um, this section, the license examination, it goes through your state exam. It talks about the two different sections, the national section and the state section. It talks about retaking. If you have to, if you fail either section, you have to go back and retake it. Again, it's 156 bucks every time you go. Your application is good for 180 days. Sample test questions, isn't that handy? It kind of gives you what the questions are going to look like. 
Um, we looked at this before, a little outline. When you guys are preparing for your state exam, how many questions are you gonna see on each topic? The topics that you're seeing relate to the topics in the syllabus. So if you wanna know what's covered under basic real estate concepts, then you go to the syllabus and you look under basic real estate concepts. But use this little outline as a guide, you know, level one, level two, level three, what we call green star, yellow star, red star. Use this as a guide to help you know where to focus your study attention. Are you gonna spend all your study time on property taxation and assessments? I mean, I wouldn't, because you only have two questions, one on the national and one on the state. Um, what about brokerage relationships? There's 22 questions, which is basically our unit seven. So I didn't just say ignore property taxation and assessment. I'm just saying use this to help you know where to focus your time. While this is for the state exam, it's safe to say that the weight of this outline is also gonna apply for my exam. I'm not gonna give you the exact number of questions you're gonna see on each topic, but the weight is the same. So for my exam, are you gonna have a lot of questions on brokerage relationships? Yes. So you can use this to help prepare for mine as well. Um, national section has 80 questions, state section has 40. You also have what they call pre-test questions or test the test questions. You're gonna have a handful of questions that don't count for or against you. And you'll never know. You'll never know if it's a valid test question or a pretest. What you're doing is vetting test questions for future test takers. You know what previous test takers did for you guys? Vetted the test questions. So before they release it to count it, they do these test the test. So some of them will count, some of them won't. Uh, your passing score on both sections, again, you gotta pass both sections to get your license. If you pass the national and fail the state, you have to go back and retake the state, 156 bucks. Here's some good helpful hints. Uh, applying for and scheduling with PSI when you're ready to contact PSI. That 180 day period. Here's that $156 exam fee again how you contact PSI to schedule. You can schedule online. They've included screenshots now. So again, you're not ready for this yet, but know that it's here. When you are ready to schedule with PSI, this is your guide, this is your book, where you wanna go. Um, security procedures, um, there's the check-in. I mean, you're basically emptying your pockets, right? They're gonna give you a little locker. Have you put everything up? Guys, they started doing online last May. It's almost a year old. And I've had students take online. And while I can't tell you what to do, I think going in person is much easier. I, I think it's much better. I've heard online is tough for several reasons. Um, one, online, evidently they don't let you take a bathroom break. They don't let you have water. So I don't know your you know, your tolerance for how <laughs> often you need to run to the restroom, but absolutely something to take into consideration. Um, how many of you have already formed the habit of moving your mouth when you read test questions? Do you read questions out loud to yourself? You can't do that online. They'll assume you are cheating. So I'm not gonna tell you guys what to do. When you get to this point and you're ready to go to PSI, They'll send you all the information and you choose online or in person. But from what I've heard, if I were you, if I were you, I would go in person. But you, and, and if you do online, I need your feedback because this is how I know what I know is from former students. Um, somebody said they heard there's a lot of glitches. I know one girl, the, the, the lady from a couple classes ago, she ran into some glitches and for some reason her clock didn't stop. And so while she was trying to get her connection back up, she lost time. So you guys make that decision, fair enough. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you, you need to explore your options and you need to decide which one is best for you, okay? I've heard online, actually in person too, I've heard they'll make you, if you wear eyeglasses, they'll make you take your glasses off and show them like the, the inside pieces, make sure you don't have a little camera or something on your eyeglasses. 
it's tough. And don't get me wrong, it's tight security going in person too. Don't get me wrong, it's tight security going in person too. But online, there's a lot more opportunities to cheat online. And so it's even tighter. The security process is even tighter online. Yeah, she said they made her roll up her sleeves and show them the, you know, the, and make sure their statute of frauds wasn't written on the inside of her arm, you know, stuff like that. So we have choices. Um, what else? PSI. And it may talk about online in here as well. If you have a documented disability, you might be granted special accommodations. So if you have a documented disability, this section's for you um, on how you schedule your time with PSI. Do you need more time? You know, whatever. Um, they'll tell you how to walk through that and how you can be granted your special accommodations. Uh, arrival and check-in, blah, 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 blah. There's something else I wanna say here too, okay. You get two and a half hours for the national section. You get an hour and a half for the state section. If you are in person, you can take a break in between. If you are in person, you can get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of your national section, but your clock doesn't stop. Okay, so at least if you're in person, you get a break in between. From what I'm hearing online, I don't think you do. So if you're doing it online, you're going, what is that, four hours? Don't drink a lot of water that morning, right? So if that, to me, that's the biggest thing about going in person. But again, if you take a break in the middle of a section, your clock doesn't stop, but you do get a break in between. And it even tells you here, break time taken at the test center between sections will not be deducted. When you do pass, you get your license, the real estate commission will mail you a license. Uh, what happens if you fail or miss, you reapply six months to reapply, 156 bucks every time you walk in the door or log on. Um, and then, yeah, the process of getting your license. So license renewal, we're actually going to talk about this in license law and commission rule. So, you know, page 32 or testing, testing points. So make sure you read this over post licensing provisional brokers. I think it even talks about continuing education. We'll talk about all that when we get into license law and commission law. Questions on your state, just your state exam. Questions on your state exam, doing your application. I swear everything you need is, is, is in this little booklet. Yeah, I have a quick question you maybe said this but do you know pretty much immediately if you passed yes. or failed good question thank you so you hit submit and it says are you sure and you say yes and boom okay. you pass or fail yep same thing okay. with my exam same thing with mine exam. awesome you right away yep very good thank yep. you yep good question thank you Anything else about the process? If you guys go to ncrec.gov, Real Estate Commission's website, or you can just Google North Carolina Real Estate Commission, at the home page, if you scroll near the bottom, it says apply for a license. And when you click on apply here, it takes you into your application. You can create an account and save it so you can come back. I don't think there's any reason why every single one of you can't go ahead and click on that button and see, start gathering the information that they're gonna be asking for. It does not hurt you. Don't do it now, wait until after class, but there's no reason why you guys can't click on that button and start seeing the information that they need to gather from you. So it's ncrec.gov. And you can also order your background check through here as well. So there will be a link to connect to the company that does the background check. But again, y'all don't order it today because it's only good for six months. So again, if you get it back next week, you're, you're wasting three weeks, right? So wait until closer to time, closer to our exam, or wait until after our exam, whatever you're comfortable with. I can't answer that for you. I get that question a lot. What should I do? I don't know. I'm not you. 
how how anxious are you to get started? If you're rip roaring ready to go, go ahead and order your background check, right? So as soon as you pass my exam, you can submit your application. If you can wait a minute, possibly consider waiting a minute. Remember, <laughs> it's dipping into your wallet. So take that into consideration. Julie, one more question. <laughs> On the test, um, do you have the capability of, like, if you're struggling with a question, you can revisit it and come back, or do you have yep. to answer them nope. sequentially? Nope. You can go back. Yep. Okay. Yep. Bookmark it. Yep. So so what I, if I'm understanding correctly, I just, let me kind of tell you what I think you've been telling me, tell me if I'm right. Um, so if we, <clears throat> if we want to, you know, take our state, you know, the, the, the non, I'm going to call it the non-Julie exam. Okay. Um, like we take, we're in your class, we pass your test. And if we want to, while it's fresh on our mind, okay, we, we passed yours. Now we want to sit for the, you know, the big kahuna exam um if we that takes time to process that takes time for the the you know the, the folks down in raleigh to look over your application so if we would like to be able to say take the 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 board exam within 30 days it might be a good idea to go ahead and start for me if i wanted to do that it might be a good idea for me to go ahead and start that that process like the criminal background check um, just right. to kind of get rolling, but ne I don't necessarily need to commit that money if like all of a sudden I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I really, maybe I want another two weeks to study. Um, but I guess my, and I can't remember, I was trying to follow along with you in my little booklet, but we, once we start the application process, when should, how long is our criminal background check good for before it expires? It, okay six months okay so if you order it today your time starts ticking while you're still in class okay and that's why my suggestion would be wait closer to may 19th right and and, and yeah, again how are you I, feeling how are you feeling you know about my exam so and, and i'm those are rhetorical yeah. questions right i i can't right no that's that i just wanted to kind of hear i want to make i wanted to make sure i was yep. i said it back to you so you kind of i was understanding you yep so let's see, a question good. comes I, in I if don't, you don't, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, if you don't pass the test and it's been longer than six months, you have to reapply another background check, yes. So your application and your background check are only good for six months. They may or may not be the same six month period, right? Because you can't submit the application until you finish my class. You can't order your background check. That six, does that make sense? That six month clock starts so if you don't do it within six months of your application, then you're gonna to have to go back into the background check, which might be another reason why you may wanna wait a week or two to order that background check. So those dates are closer together. Those dates are more closely aligned. If you go three years from whatever, May 19th, whatever day we finish this class, if you go three years and you still don't have a real estate license and you still want a real estate license, then you come back and see me again in pre-licensing. So with my exam, when you pass my exam, Lane will send you a certificate of completion. If you're doing your entire application and background check now, the only thing you'll be waiting on is that certificate of completion. You guys with me? That'll be the last piece that you need. Once you get that certificate of completion from Lane, if you've ordered your background, you've completed everything else, then you need that certificate of completion to finish your application and submit it. But the certificate of completion that you get from Lane is good for three years. If you don't pass my end of class exam on May 19th and you make at least a 50%, you get another opportunity. And we have a retake scheduled for May 24th. So if you don't pass on the 19th 
but you make at least a 50%, you get a second chance. Guys, not all schools offer a retake. Not all schools offer a second chance. If you don't make a 50% on the 19th or you don't pass the retake on the 24th, you have to take the class again. You retake the class until you get a certificate of completion. You don't have to retake it with Carolina School of Real Estate. I will say Lane will offer you a discount if you have to retake it. So there's that. It's kind of a gamble, isn't it, Valerie? I don't know if you guys see your chat there. I appreciate you sharing that with us, Valerie. For my exam, you have to make a 75%. I have 112 questions on mine. You have to make a 75% for my exam. Retake is, I think 175. That's a lane question, so don't hold me to that. But I think it's 100. Uh, my end of class exam is online. We use a program called Class Marker. So the email that you guys got from Lane, the same email that you use to access class every day or every single time we come together, it also has information on Class Marker. Class Marker is the program that I use to give my end of class exam. So the link that you're looking at here is a tutorial about what Class Marker looks like. Y'all, please look at this before May 19th to take away some of that stress, right? So you know what to expect on the 19th. It's in the email you guys use. This is the link you click on every single day to be here. So it's right there as well. You'll be using Class Marker, and then I will be watching you on Zoom. Um, the very last thing that we do together is go through the rules and expectations of my exam. The very last thing we do will be go through the rules and expectations of my exam. So we're all on the same page. The Real Estate Commission doesn't tolerate cheating. Guess what? Lane and Julie don't either. So do what we can to make sure everybody's keeping everybody honest. So we'll talk about that whenever we're done. So class marker, again, this little tutorial, I think, I, I don't think I know Dr. Bowser um, walks you through what class marker looks like. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that. I'm a lot nicer than PSI. <laughs> Other questions, state exam or my exam? It's a lot to take in, I know, but again, you guys, it's a process. Every once in a while, we get an email from the Real Estate Commission saying that, you know, they're getting students calling them saying, you know, PSI won't call me back. And the commission's going, well, we haven't issued your Notice of exam eligibility at PSI doesn't know you exist until the real estate commission approves you. So you got to look at the application process. The other thing I want to point out to you guys, you guys are in, by the time you go, go take your exams, you're going to be in the renewal period. The real estate commission renews every year by June 30th. We'll talk about that when we get to license law and commission rule. But because of the time of year that we're in, uh, you guys can expect some delays. That's just all there is to it. So also in Learn Test Pass, I have a letter from the commission. Um, again, I'm in the welcome section. Welcome to the course. And these are notice to license exam candidates after May 1st. So this what tells you what happens if you pass before July 1st. Um, applicants who pass exam on or before May 31st applicants who pass between June 1st and June 30th. So you guys, whenever you're planning on going to PSI, refer to this notice of license exam candidates because this could affect you. If you're waiting until after July 1st, you have nothing to worry about. But if you're wanting to go to PSI in May or June, then you need to make sure you look at this letter. And again, we'll talk about that June 30th deadline when we get into license law and commission rule. Um, the average for my exam, I'm hovering at about 67, 68%. It's a tough pass rate, not average exam. I'm sorry, 
pass rate. Woo, that, uh, no wonder I was getting some weird looks. Let's all take a big break, deep breath together. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> Everybody breathe with me. All right, sorry about that. <laughs> Guys, I was not kidding when I stood here on day one and said, this stuff is hard. This test is hard. These exams are tough. Please, please, please focus, focus, focus. Uh, there is a cram course. Uh, we have it scheduled for you guys on May 14th. And Rashid's gonna do that for you guys. She's gonna primarily focus on the state specific stuff and math. I will send you Anne's Zoom link on May 13th. I'm not sending it to you before then because then you'll forget it and you'll call me on May 14th in a panic. I need the link. So I'm just gonna send it to you guys on May 13th so you'll have it. Anne does not record the cram course. Anne does not record her cram course. Question came in, have the test always been this hard? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, actually in some ways, I think you guys have it easier than what I did. Don't get me started on that. They say that our real estate exam is just as hard as the bar exam and that the people that came up with the bar exam are the same people that came up with the real estate exam. I don't know who they are, but yeah, I wouldn't disagree with them. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. Guys, here's the deal. What's the real estate commission's main purpose? To protect the public. So before they issue you a license to go out and help their public buy and sell houses, think about the price tag on these things. They need to make sure that you guys possess the minimum competency. They're only making sure testing to make sure you have the minimum competency. Which is why once you get your license, you can expect a lot more training, a lot more education. We're just scratching surfaces here. Um, are you allowed to record the cram course yourself? That I do not know the answer to. I, I don't think Ann likes to record, so I doubt she has that turned on. There is in Learn Test Pass. The very bottom, a cram section. There is a cram class recording. This is from Dr. Bowser, March or so. So you got the cram course on the 24th, plus you got Dr. Bowser's learn test pass. What other questions do I have? This is the time, state exam or my exam? In the learn test pass quizzes, Julie, who, uh, who authors those questions? Is that from Learn test pass. your school? Learn test pass. Learn yeah. test pass. Yep. And, and that's a separate entity from Carolina School that we, we have access to that because we're students now and we will we have to pay a fee if we want to access it later or we always have no, an account? No, no, Lane, Lane's bought this for you guys. This is included in your okay. class. So you guys will have okay. access to Learn Test Pass for four months after this class is over. If you need it for more than four months, just reach out to Lane. Lane will extend it for you, but she, got, she doesn't know that you need it, right? So if you need it for more than four months, just call Lane or email Lane and say, can I have Learn Test Pass for longer? And she'll say, sure. You just got to communicate with her. So if you need Learn Test Pass for longer than four months, just communicate with her. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so there's only, for the state, uh, state exam, there's only one place that I can get the uh, background check, right? Correct. But I've only been in North Carolina for four years, and the previous three years I was in Puerto Rico. Do they get that yep. stuff? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. 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 You're going to spend more money, and it's going to take you longer. How much more, and how much longer? I don't know, but it's going to take you longer to get yours back because that company will have to go to Puerto Rico to get yours for that three years. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Sure, hang out with me. Okay. Guys, let me end with this. We're getting ready to take a break and then we're going to start in unit 14. Don't leave me just yet. This exam, these exams, 
are in no way any kind of indicator of what kind of real estate license agent you're going to be. This is not tell you if you're going to be a top producer, if you're going to get in there and kick butt and take names. The only thing the commission is testing you on is your minimum competency. Should you need to retake this class or should you need to go back to PSI testing center? It's okay. There are a lot of top producers out there that have had to take the class and the test multiple times. So if you have to go back, it's okay. It's, I promise you there are worse things that have happened to you. I don't know what they are, nor do I need to, but I promise there are worse things that have happened. Please don't let these tests be some kind of indicator about what kind of agent you're gonna get, gonna be. I failed the state exam the first time I took it. And I was in the industry, I was an administrator and I failed. I had to go to work the next day and look at my 70 agents that were ready to celebrate with me and say, not yet, you know, guess what? I had my little pity party, you know, I found out right away, it said submit, and he said, sure. And I said, yeah, and I said, you fail. And I was like, I mean, I still hadn't even processed that I would finished taking the test yet. And I got the you fail. So of course I run out in the parking lot and call mom because that what we do when we're upset, you know, and mom's like, I'm sure you did better than you thought. I already know, you know, so I had my little pity party that day, picked myself up, dusted myself off, went back to PSI and passed the dang test. Okay. You can't let it rule your life. You can't let it dictate what kind of agent you're going to be. One of the biggest top producers I know went to PSI testing center seven times. This is what I have to say to you. If you really, really want this, you're going to do whatever it takes to get it. So my question to you is, how badly do you want it? And if you really, really want it, you'll do what it takes to get it. Fair enough. No broker in charge. No buyer, no seller is ever going to look at you and say, how many times did you have to take a class? All they want to know is, do you have a license? Fair? Everybody take some big deep breaths with me. And we will get you through it. You got to do your part. You got to work for it. And you got to want it. I can't want it more than you. <laughs> okay? All right. All right, I know I'm a little early on break, but let's go ahead and take 10. And when we come back, unit 14.
All right. Stay back. Sick attendance. We are heading into unit 14. Units 14 and 15 are our financing units. And the thing I was called the trick. And if you're just coming back, please tell me you're back. Sorry, taking attendance. The trick to units 14 and 15, I want you all to put on your lender's hat. The trick to 14 and 15 is to think like a lender. So we're gonna take a break from being a real estate agent and we're gonna put on our lender's hat and we're getting some basics of financing. Do I have any lenders on the call? Any mortgage lenders? Sometimes I do. Sometimes I do have some of those, but it doesn't look like I have any this time. Um, to be a mortgage lender, it's a class and you got to pass a test and you got to get a license, da, 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 da. If you're interested in going to mortgage lending school, start with Google. <laughs> It'll kind of point you in the right direction. We are going through the basics. While we're not becoming lenders, and we still need to know when to stay in our lane, but we need a basic understanding of how the lending process works because we're working with buyers and sellers every day that are doing what? Working with lenders, getting loans. So let's all put on our lender's hat as we go through these first couple units. And we're gonna start with 14, I'm on page 364. And we're gonna start with some real estate financing, some basic principles. And in unit 14, we're gonna distinguish between something called a title theory state and something called a lien theory state. We're gonna identify the provisions of a promissory note and a deed of trust. So we're gonna talk about the components. And then in unit 14, there's a lot of math. So when we get to 14, we may get started on it today. Guys, Next week is gonna be a big math week. So come prepare. And before we leave today, we'll talk about what, ne what next week is gonna look like. So in unit 14, the first thing we need to do is just stop and define some words. The mortgage is the pledge of real estate as security. The mortgage is the instrument that the lender has to hold in the event of the borrower's default. If the borrower defaults, the lender may take the property. We'll talk more about this as we go. North Carolina, we're awfully fancy in North Carolina. And in North Carolina, we refer to our mortgage as the deed of trust. Is this not confusing? In unit five, we talked about the deed, which is the proof of ownership. But now we're introducing you something called the deed of trust, which is the mortgage, which is the collateral that the lender has. So I'm referring to two different documents here. The deed is the proof of ownership. The deed of trust is the mortgage, is the collateral that the lender has. The two parties, to the mortgage are the mortgagor and the mortgagee. The OR is the give or, the EE is the receive. The mortgagor is the borrower. Mortgagor, borrower. The mortgagee is the lender. The buyer or borrower is giving the lender the collateral to use real estate as security in the event of their default. Mortgage or is the borrow or. Mortgagee is the lender. Equitable title we were introduced to with our installment land contract a little bit ago. 
this is what allows possession. This is what allows the owner to possess and use the property, even though they owe money on it, even though they owe lender. We have an equitable title. The lender gives us permission to be there. Lenders get a bad rap. I honestly don't understand why. Let's talk this through for a second. Let's say you're buying a house. My screen keeps going in and out. Are you guys here? Okay. Let's say you're buying a house with $100,000. Sales price is $100,000 and you are putting down 10%, which means you're putting down $10,000 of your own money. How much are you asking the lender for? Who has the biggest interest in that property? You or the lender? I mean, your $10,000 is cute and all, but who's bringing the money for this property? The lender. the lender. The lender, absolutely. So I don't understand why lenders get bad. Lenders, you know, have all these rules. and They just gave you $90,000. Are you kidding me? They got to protect their interest. Everybody with me? They've got to protect their interest. So they give you equitable title. They allow you to live there. You can possess the property. You can use the property. You can rent the property. You can profit from the property. You can do whatever you want to on the property. But they still got to keep their interest. If the borrower defaults, they fail to make a payment. When you fail to make a payment, it's considered default. We're gonna look in just a second at the agreement that the borrower and the lender have, the mortgagor and mortgagee. And the agreement spells out what happens in the event of default. Like how many payments do you have to miss before the lender starts foreclosure kind of thing. So we'll talk about that agreement, that contract in just a second. This is a green star. You guys can't see that? Hypothecation is the act of pledging the property as security. You're pledging your property as security to the lender. Okay, good, good. You're pledging your security to the lender or the property as security to the property, to the lender. There are two different types of states, two different types of states. One type of state, not North Carolina, is called a lean theory state. A lean theory state uses a two-party instrument. They have the mortgage or who's the borrower and the mortgagee, who's the lender. The document that they use is the mortgage. And in lien theory states, the borrower has both the legal and the equitable title. The borrower gets it all. Lien theory states use something called a judicial foreclosure process. Judicial foreclosure process is foreclosure that happens in a court of law. It's lengthy, it's expensive, it's drawn out. It sounds tiring. So lean theory states, not North, and I don't know what states are lean theory states and what states aren't. What I do know is North Carolina is not a lean theory state. So then what is North Carolina? North Carolina is a title theory state. And in North Carolina, we use a three-party instrument. We have the grantor, the beneficiary, and the trustee. The grantor is the borrower. Grantor, mortgagor, borrower. The lender is the beneficiary. And then there's this third party who's an impartial trustee. A trustee is gonna be an attorney. The trustee manages the affairs for the lender. 
the trustee manages the affairs for the beneficiary. So in the event of default, the lender's not dealing with it. The trustee is. The trustee's doing it on behalf of the lender. Again, mortgage deed of trust means the same thing. But North Carolina, our document is the deed of trust. The borrower has equitable title. The trustee holds the legal title. And we use something called a power of sale foreclosure. The power of sale foreclosure gives the trustee the right to start the foreclosure process. They don't have to go through the courts. Our foreclosure process is much faster, much less expensive. When in North Carolina, a borrower gets a home loan, they agree when they sign their contract with the lender that we're getting ready to talk about. They agree at the time of originating the loan. If I default, you can start the foreclosure process. We don't have to go through a judge. All the trustee has to do is go through like a mini hearing, like a, like a clerk of courts, just to get the ball rolling. It's not a full out court process. Power of sales, much easier. So there's two documents in a mortgage, in a home loan. The first is the promissory note. This is the contract between the lender and the borrower. The contract between the mortgagor and mortgagee is the promissory note. Think of the promissory note as the IOU. Have you ever given somebody a napkin with IOU written on it? No? Am I the only one that's owed people so many money? <laughs> The promissory note is the IOU. It's the financing instrument. It's the contract between the lender and the borrower. We're going to talk a little bit more about the promissory note in just a bit. The borrower signs the promissory note. The promissory note is not recorded. We do not record the contract. The other document is the mortgage or in North Carolina called the deed of trust. That's the document that is recorded. That's the security instrument. That's the collateral that the lender has in the event of the borrower's default. When we get to unit 21, we get to go to closing in unit 21. Does that sound exciting? So we get to go to closing in unit 21. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about the closing process of the attorney. Remember we attend settlement once we leave settlement, then the attorney does closing. And remember the very last act of closing is the attorney to record the buyer's brand new deed. As soon as the attorney records the brand new deed, the very next breath they record the deed of trust. Congratulations, here are the key to your new home. You already have a lien on the property. That lien is protecting the lender's interest. Remember our lien priority? Lien priority says our superior liens are paid first. Superior liens are real property taxes and government special assessments. And then after that, they're paid in the order in which they're recorded, except for the mechanics lien. So the lender wants to make sure that their lien is recorded first. The lender wants to make sure in the event of default, if the borrower is gonna lose the property, once the government's paid, the lender wants to make sure that they're paid as well. We'll talk a little bit more about that process in just a bit. So we'll come back to the promissory note. Let's put that off to the side for a second. And let's focus just on the deed of trust, just on the mortgage. And as with other documents that we've seen, there are essential elements of a valid deed of trust. Remember, if we're talking about the validity of a document, we're asking how does this stand up in a court of law? So there's essential elements of a deed of trust. 
the deed of trust has to refer to the promissory note. It has to mention the contract, the agreement between the lender and the borrower, the mortgagor, borrower, mortgagee is the lender. The deed of trust states that it's a security and it's a security for in the event of the borrower's default. Again, it's the uh, deed of trust is the collateral that the lender has for the borrower, from the borrower. The deed of trust is gonna name the lender and the borrower, mortgagee, mortgagor. There's our legal description again. The deed of trust is in writing and signed by all parties, lender, borrower, statute of frauds, in writing and signed. Why? To be enforceable. The deed of trust is recorded to be enforceable, Connor Act. And it's delivered to and accepted by the lender or in North Carolina, the trustee. They take the deed of trust. They have that collateral. Guys, here's the deal. As long as the borrower keeps making their payments, the lender's good, right? We don't have a problem until the borrower stops making those payments. And this is why we have these kinds of things set up. The deed of trust, the, the foreclosure process. It's not a problem until it's a problem. And it becomes a problem when the borrower stops making those payments and the lender's got to get their money back. Think of the lender as an investor. An investor makes their money by money, right? It takes money to make money. And the lender is the same way. They use that money to make money so they can issue more money. We'll talk more about that as we go on. In a deed of trust, there's responsibilities, there's obligations, there are duties of each party, the mortgagor and the mortgagee. So let's talk about the obligations of the borrower. Borrower, mortgagor, their biggest obligation is to make their payment on time every time. They made a commitment, they signed a promissory note, they signed an IOU saying, I'm gonna pay you X amount every month for the next, however the long of the term is, is it 15 years, 30 years? The borrower has to pay, is responsible for property taxes. Now we'll talk about how the lender helps the borrower with that in just a second. The borrower has an obligation to maintain homeowner's insurance. They have an obligation to maintain the property. And the borrower should be getting lender authorization before making any major alter alterations or demolition. Remember, who has the biggest interest in this property? It's the lender. Their interest diminishes as that gets paid down. You wanna not deal with a lender? Come up with $100,000 cash. That's all you gotta do. <laughs> Where are my homeowners in the call? Where are my homeowners? Handful of you? As homeowners, we're gonna talk about your mortgage payment in just a bit. But as homeowners, it's probably a safe bet. This isn't the case for all home loans. But part of your monthly mortgage payment consists of a portion of the annual property taxes and a portion of your homeowner's insurance. So you're paying your monthly payment to the lender and you're paying some of your taxes and some of your homeowner's insurance each month. And when those bills come due, the lender has that money to pay those bills on your behalf. I get a letter every year from Randolph County that says your taxes have been paid. And I think, well, gee, that's nice. Thank you, I don't have to worry about it. And I get an email from Allstate once a year that says your homeowner's insurance has been renewed for another year. And I think, well, golly, that's really nice. My lender is so kind to pay these bills on my behalf. But guess what? The lender doesn't do it for me. 
the lender does it to protect their interest. By the lender requiring homeowners insurance and even taking it a step further and making sure that that is paid, they make sure that that bill is paid every year. What if the house burns down and the owner just walks away? What is the lender gonna get from that? Yeah, nothing, are they? What if the obligation is on you to pay your property taxes and you don't? You don't pay this year, you don't pay next year, you don't pay the following year. Eventually, the county can foreclose on you. And if the county forecloses on you, do you think the county cares about selling the property to get not only their money back, but the lender's money as well? Do they care about what you owe the lender? Everybody shake your head no. So the reason the lender pays these bills on your behalf, collects from you throughout the year, and pays these bills on your behalf is to protect their interest. If you're a cash buyer, you gotta pay taxes. You're not gonna get a letter that says, um, these taxes have been paid. You're going to get a letter that says you owe X amount. If you're a cash buyer or if you've paid the loan off, homeowner's insurance is not required. Homeowner's insurance is only required when you have a lender involved. If you don't have a lender involved, homeowner's insurance is highly recommended. We'll talk a little bit more about your mortgage payment and how that works, the math of it. Wait, I'm doing fine. I'm sorry? Goodness, that startled me. You got a lot of people talking on the phone in class. All right. So obligations of the borrower to maintain the property. There's also rights of the borrower. The borrower has the right to possess and use the property. They have the right, it's something called quiet enjoyment. The borrower has the right to possess and use the property without interference from the lender. The borrower also has the right of defeasance. What this says is when you pay that mortgage off, the deed of trust is null and void. How do you cut your ties from the lender? Pay them off. The borrower also has the right of redemption. What are you doing if you're redeeming yourself? If you're redeeming yourself, you're saving yourself from something. And in this case, what are you saving yourself from? Foreclosure. So the borrower has the right to try to save themselves from foreclosure. And we'll talk about those rights in just a second. The lender also has rights. The lender has the right to assign the debt, assign the loan. What's an assignment? All the terms stay the same. The only thing that changes is what? The name of one of the parties. It's not uncommon for lenders to sell or service their loans. If your lender assigns your loan, assigns your debt, another lender's taking it on, and we're gonna talk about why they do that. We'll see that on Tuesday. And if they assign your debt, your monthly payment stays the same, your interest rate stays the same, your term stays the same, everything stays the same. The only thing that changes is the name of the lender. The lender also has the right to foreclose on you. If you stop, that's your promise to them. I promise to pay you back in these terms. And if you don't do that, they have the right to foreclose on you. Thank you. So as we mentioned earlier, there are a couple different types, methods of foreclosure. Other states use a judicial foreclosure. 
Judicial foreclosure uses a sheriff's deed. I always remember it this way. If the judge is going to take the property, does the judge themselves actually go take the property? They send who? They send the sheriff. So if we go through judicial foreclosure, we do this using a sheriff's deed. North Carolina uses a non-judicial foreclosure. Got the power of sale. And we use the trustee's deed because who's handling the fares on behalf of the lender? The trustee. Again, it's the promissory note that refers to the power of sale. The power of sale gives the trustee the power to sell the property in the event of the borrower's default. And when you sign that promissory note, you're giving the trustee that power. So again, the trustee doesn't have to go to a judge. The attorney doesn't have to go to a judge. You've already given them that permission to foreclose when you sign that promissory note. Power of sale. Other states may also use something called a strict foreclosure. We don't do this in North Carolina, and I'm going to say this is pretty rare anyway. Um, a strict foreclosure, the court will establish a time to get everything paid off. So they may look at the borrower and say, all right, if you can come up with everything due in you know, the next 30 days, then you can avoid the foreclosure process. I think strict foreclosure, I know it's not used in North Carolina but I think it's pretty rare. Do I have any questions so far? Do we have to know anything? I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Good. Good. Do, do we have to know anything about um, like a, a PMI or anything like- I'm getting there. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Another question came in, the trustee is always the attorney involved. The word always makes me nervous, but yes, the, the lender will have the trustee is going to be an attorney handling the, the affairs because they're the ones that have that power to do. Does the lender have to sell after default? Or can they, that's a good question. So if the lender acquires or takes the property through foreclosure, do they have to sell or can they assume it? It's theirs now, right? So they can do whatever they want to. Um, I think it's gonna be rare to find lenders in like, for example, the investment business, you know, but if they do have a, a chapter that does um, rent, then maybe they can add that to their inventory. But I think basically what the lender's looking to do, the faster turnaround time they have, acquire the property through foreclosure, turn around and sell it, then they can get their money back faster because the lender doesn't want to lose anything less than, but yeah, it's there. So they can do whatever they want to. Guys, I think when we think about buyers or bar homeowners defaulting, we tend to think of this happening 10, 20 years after they've owned the property. I just think that's what we assume. I have had, I've known cases of buyers that never made their first mortgage payment. They bought the house, obtained the loan, and they never sent the lender a penny. So let's go back to our little scenario. You buy a house, it's purchased $100,000, you put down your cute little $10,000, and now you owe the lender $90,000 and you never make your first mortgage payment. The lender cares about selling that property, the cost of sale, which I'm getting ready to talk about, and getting their $90,000 back. That's all the lender cares about. The more you pay, the longer you own the property, the less risk you become, right? The more you pay down your loan, let's just say another scenario, $100,000 sales price, you show up with 50%, which means now you're only asking the lender for $50,000. Which one is less risky to the lender? The 50,000, right? 
because through the eyes of the lender, they're thinking, can I sell this property back for $50,000 and get my money back? Can I sell this property for X amount? You guys with me? And when it comes to foreclosure, if you guys have noticed in the real estate market, various sources, Zillow, Realtor.com, foreclosure homes tend to be a little bit less than non-foreclosure homes. And part of the reason is, is because the lender just cares about getting their money back. Does that make sense? They're not low trying to get top market value. They're not trying to have competing buyers, whatever. They just want to get their money back. That's what they care about. Makes sense. If I lent you money, you know what I would care about? Getting my money back, right? So the lender, that's their job. Am I freezing? Are we having issues today? No, it might be on your end then. And in and, and this market is, is definitely different um, because now you got buyers going in underwater. You got buyers buying more, paying more than what the property is worth. But the loan is still issued on what the home is worth. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that process. Lenders aren't jacking up their costs just because buyers are. So we'll talk a little bit more. Buyers are going to have to come up. They're coming up with more money out of, I don't know where all this money is. It must be stuffed in their mattress or something. I don't know. It's not stuffed in my mattress. It's not buried in my backyard. So I'm not sure exactly where it is, but by golly, they're coming up with it from somewhere. So we'll talk a little bit more about that process in just a bit. You guys remember back in unit three, we talked about um, priority of liens and how liens are paid. Remember we had superior liens are always paid first. Superior liens are what? Taxes and government special assessments. And after taxes and government special assessments, all liens are paid in the order in which they're recorded, except for the mechanics lien that's paid in the order in which the work began. There's your crash, crash cram course for unit three. You guys remember that? In the event of a foreclosure, lien priority changes a little bit. So if the lender has to take the property, if the lender has to foreclose, then lien priority changes a little bit. And the distribution of the proceeds of the sale, we're gonna start by paying the cost of the sale. The trustee is gonna get paid first. So the cost of the sale, whatever the cost to foreclose is, then we pay our superior liens. Then we're gonna pay the deed of trust because the lender is generally the one that starts the foreclosure process. So the lender is gonna make sure that they get paid, but look at where the lender is in this list. Does the lender get paid first? No, nah, they get paid after the trustee and after the government. So they're down here on the list a little ways, aren't they? Once the deed of trust, once the lender's paid, then any other liens get paid in the order in which they're recorded, except for the mechanics lien. And if, and hear me stress the word if, if there's any money left over, the surplus goes to the borrower. Creditors can't make any more than what they're owed. Creditors can't charge for pain and suffering, right? Creditors can only collect what they're owed. So, same thing with lien priority in a foreclosure, you have all these people standing in line with their handout. They're all standing in a line and this is the order that they're standing. And you sell the home and the, the trustee gets paid, the government gets paid, the lender gets paid. And when that money's out, that money's out. Once the sales price has been divvied between these people standing in line, there is no more money. So could you have lien holders at the end of the line that don't get anything? Could you have lien holders? Because when the money's out, the money's out. So by filing a lien, you're not guaranteeing that you're going to get paid. By filing a lien, you're simply guaranteeing your place in line. And at this point, all you can do is hope and pray, fingers crossed, that there's enough for you to get paid. Does that make sense to you guys? 
So let's go back. No, I didn't want to do it. $100,000 sales price. You go to closing today, you buy a house for $100,000, you take out a loan for $90,000. That's how much you owe the lender. Let's say you never make that first mortgage payment. The lender has to be able to sell the house for more than $90,000 because they got to pay the cost of sale, they got to pay the government, and then they get paid. This is why you're a risk to the lender. It's not like the sales price goes directly to them. Is this making sense? They got to have other people in line ahead of them. So that's why the less you owe the lender, the less risk you are to them. Our other scenario, $100,000, you take out a $50,000 loan. Now you only owe the lender $50,000. Could they do better at selling your house to pay the cost of sale, pay the government, and then make sure they put that $50,000 back in their pocket? The less money you owe, the less money you borrow, the less risk you are. As time goes on, the less risky you become because all the lender cares about is getting their money back. Does that make sense? We all please go easier on lenders. They charge me money to borrow money. Well, of course they do. Why would they not? Lenders don't have like this free money tree out back, right? It's not like they can go pluck a $90,000 bill from the tree and say, here you go. Lenders got to get their money from somewhere as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that process in unit 15. Any questions so far about what we've talked about? Uh, we talked about redemption. The redemption period is the period that the borrower has to redeem themselves. And what type of redemption period you have depends on what state you're standing in. You also got a nice little picture at the bottom of page 368. I like pictures. Equity, other states may use an equity of redemption. The equity of redemption period happens before the foreclosure sale. So the borrower has the opportunity in other states, if they can come up with the whole note due, they can avoid foreclosure. North Carolina, we use a statutory redemption, which means the redemption period happens after the sale. After the foreclosure sale, the borrower has a 10 day period to come up with what they owe. So after the sale in North Carolina, the borrower has a 10 day redemption period to redeem themselves, come up with the whole note due. If they can't, it's a done deal. If they can, the lender doesn't get the property back. So remember the lien priority we just talked about. Everybody's standing there with their hand out, right? Everybody's standing in line in order with their hand out. The guys at the end of the line, the guys at the end of the line, maybe there's not enough money to pay everybody. Maybe the cost of the sale, the sales price, isn't enough to pay everybody. So if anybody at the end of the line doesn't get paid their full amount, they could do what something's called, bless you, a deficiency judgment. A deficiency judgment allows a lien holder to put a judgment on the owner. After the foreclosure sale, you guys remember again, back to unit three, a judgment is a general lien. Why don't you guys remind me in the chat what a general lien attaches to? What does a general lien attach to? General lien.
the general lean, I love the question marks. Y'all crack me up with that. The general lean attaches to the person. The specific lean attaches to the property. The general lien attaches to the person. So a judgment is a general lien, which means if they put a deficiency over here, I don't know what's going on today. Over here. Okay. If the lien holder puts a judgment on the borrower that attaches to the person, they're not going to be able to get a loan for anything until they pay that off. So if they can't collect everything that's owed to them, then the deficiency judgment will still protect the lien holder. Um, superior lien attaches to the property. General lien attaches to the person. Mechanics liens are paid in the order in which the property began. All a good refresher from unit three. In North Carolina, if the seller is doing seller financing and they're not paid enough, then they can't do a deficiency judgment. It's prohibited in North Carolina. Something else for the seller to take into consideration if they agree to do seller financing. So deficiency judgment. If the borrower is in default, and, and, and guys, let me just pause for a second and make sure we talk about a lot, mostly what we talk about this class is, is a buyer originating a new loan so they can purchase a home. But once they are the owner, they're known as the borrower. Even when they are the owner or the seller, they're still the borrower. So while the buyer is getting a new loan, it's not uncommon for the seller to be a borrower of their loan as well. You guys with me? So when we talk about the borrower, we're talking about the homeowner. Maybe it's the buyer that just originated the loan yesterday, or maybe it's the seller that's had the loan for the last 12 years. They're still the borrower. We're gonna talk about the seller in just a second. So if the seller is acting as the bank um, is prohibited, if the borrower is in default, Foreclosure is one possible option. If the borrower is in default, the lender may also consider a short sale. A short sale, the borrower is also in default, but short sales are less harsh than foreclosures. If the lender allows it, the short sale is the way for the borrower to go. First off, the foreclosure stays on your record for seven years, your credit history, your credit record for seven years. The short sale only stays on for three. So as the borrower, as the individual that defaulted, having that blemish on your record for three years is better than seven. In order for a short sale, there's gotta be three pieces and we have to have all three of these pieces. In order for the lien holder to consider a short sale, the purchase price is insufficient to enable the seller to pay the cost of the sale. So in other words, if the owner sells the home, they can't sell the home for enough to pay off all their debt, to pay off all of the lien holders. They're underwater. They owe more than what the property is worth. The second piece of this, the borrower doesn't have sufficient liquid assets to pay the cost of the sale. So they can't sell the house to pay off everything, plus drain their savings account, liquid assets, money you can get today. And then the third piece of this is that the borrower has to get all of the lien holders permission to accept less than what they're owed. All lien holders have to agree to take less than what they're owed so they can release the title so the seller can pass clear mark of the title. After a short sale, 
if any lien holders are still owed money, they can do a deficiency judgment on the borrower. But in order for a short sale to happen, we have to have all lien holders agree to release their liens with receiving less than what they're owed. So let's talk about how these work. The seller lists their home for sale, maybe with an agent, maybe not. They know they're in default. They've had the conversation with their lender, usually the primary lender. Buyer comes in and makes an offer. Seller and buyer negotiate the offer like we always do. None of that changes. Last offer he accepts. Communication of acceptance crosses the line. Boom, we're under contract. Once we have a contract in our hand, then the seller sends that contract to all their lien holders for the lien holders to start their process to determine how much are they going to lose? How much are they going to give up? And the lien holders have to all agree to participate in the short sale. If one lien holder says no, then the seller can't do a short sale. But the lien holders aren't going to touch it. They're not going to look at it until we have a bona fide contract in our hand. Because the lien holders want to know what is a buyer willing to pay for this house? What is a buyer willing to pay for this property? The term short sale has absolutely nothing to do with the time that these things take. Short sale has to do with the fact that the seller is short on funds. The seller is short on what they owe lien holders. They say, on average, you can expect six months for a short sale approval. Because all lien holders have to be on board. All lien holders have to agree to do this. So in North Carolina, a possible short sale is a material fact. It's not a short sale until we have the lien holder's approval. But the fact that it's a possible short sale or a potential short sale is a material fact. So in other words, when you list that property, you have to disclose that it's a potential short sale. The listing agent is advising the sellers, we're calling everybody. We're calling your attorney, we're calling your accountant, not yours, but your sellers. The seller's calling their attorney, the seller's calling their accountant. And as we mentioned the other day, and we'll look at it real quick when we come back from break, I have a short sale addendum that's attached to, added to the offer to purchase and contract. Again, in order for a short sale to happen, all lien holders have to agree to release their lien accepting less than what they're owed. I've done two of these. I was the buyer's agent on both sides. One took about four months to get lien, hold lien holders approval. The other one I did took 11 and a half months. 11 and a half months, but guess what? We had our primary loan, not we, the seller had their primary loan. They had a secondary, I think they had a third loan. They had a lien to the IR, an outstanding lien to the IRS. I don't know if you know anything about the IRS, but um, rapid response is not necessarily what they're known for. Um, so we had to wait for them to agree to take less than what they're owed. Um, there was a failed business somewhere that was attached to the house. That was a lien on the property. I, I mean, it, it add all that up, right? These guys were like big time short sale and it took that long to get all of those lien holders to agree. The name of the game with the short sale is patience. Everybody's just got to be patient. There's nobody you can call every day and say, are you working on this? Are you doing this? Where are we? Where are you? The name of the game is patience. And again, we'll look at the form in just a second. Um, this must be something special. So. I think of it in a second. I don't know. 
Maybe if you guys ask questions, I'll think what I was going to say. What questions do I have on a short sale? <laughs> Maybe you'll think, make me think what I was going to say next. Remember when we went to our listing appointment and we were going over the listing agreement with the seller and we started asking the seller all your approximate balances? Who are your lien holders and what do you owe? Part of what we're doing is helping the seller to identify if they're underwater or not. Because if they start, if those approximate balances start adding up to more than what you can sell the property for, the seller's underwater and they need to know Maybe they're eligible for a short sale, have them reach out to their lender. Um, if they owe more than what it's worth and they don't do a short sale, they're gonna have to bring money to closing. So the reason we ask these hard questions up front in the listing appointment is to make sure, guys, don't let all your hard work, don't show up on closing day for the seller to say, I don't have any money. I can't bring money to closing and all your hard work is nothing and guess how much you're gonna get paid? Because if the seller ain't got no money, they ain't got nothing to give to you, right? So you got to ask the hard questions up front. You have to have, and that's why that's in our listing agreement. So it can help us to identify if the seller needs to contact um, their lender for potential short sale. CYA, call your attorney, call your accountant. Call your attorney, call your accountant, or cover your assets. See what I did there? <laughs> Cover your butt. <laughs> so the seller's advised to call their attorney and call their accountant. Everybody's got to get involved. I know what I was going to say. See, I knew I think about it. If you allow me just for one second to whip out my crystal ball, I'm going to make a prediction. And you guys can call me in five, 10 years from now and tell me if I did right or not. There's got to be some kind of repercussion to this market that we're in right now. Buyers are going in underwater and they have less time to build up equity. And if I were to predict one repercussion from this market that we're in right now, we're going to see a lot of foreclosures and we're going to see a lot of short sales. Back in the housing market crash, which we'll talk about the housing market crash, 08, 09, 2010, we saw a lot of foreclosures and a lot of short sales. And they dipped off a little bit, but I predict that we're gonna see more of these as a result of this market. So I think that's training in your firm that you can expect in a couple years because I survived the housing market crash. I was in real estate, I was an admin, but I still survived. I feel like sometimes I should have a t-shirt. You know, I survived the housing market crash because goodness, it was, it was tough. It was tough. Um, but this is short sale training absolutely picked up because we were dealing with a lot of homeowners that were facing short sales and foreclosures. And I have a feeling a result of this market, we're going to see that again. So there's my prediction. Let's go ahead and take a break. And when we come back, we'll uh, look at our short sale form. We'll look at it real quick. So let's go ahead and take 10.
All right. Good for the last hour? But hanging in there with me? Jumping jacks? Coffee? Whatever? So got your lenders hat on? All right. So I am taking attendance. We'll get it back. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Don't make me a fibber. Let's go into Learn Test Pass really quick. Um, a couple things about this short sale form I like a whole lot. And we have it in Unit 10, but I think I also have it, yeah, in Unit 14 as well, because technically it's a financing form. But the short sale addendum, just to point out a couple things again. An addendum adds to and becomes part of, right? So if you're showing a buyer property that's a possible short sale, it has to be disclosed that it's a possible short sale. It's a material fact. So you show, you tell your buyer, this is a short sale. And they say, huh, what does that mean? And you say, we could be waiting six months at least before we close. Okay, that's the thing is we got to understand the time on this, the timeline. I can't guarantee any time. So your buyer says, okay, let's write up an offer anyway. So you write up the offer on their behalf and you include the short sale addendum. Like I said, buyer and seller negotiate terms like they always would. None of that changes. Once we have an acceptable contract, once we're under contract, then the, the seller sends the contract to all the lien holders and that's when the lien holder starts their process. Lien holders won't touch it until they have a bona fide contract in their hand, okay? So with the offer, we include the short sale addendum. A um, Couple of things about this form I like. It first starts defining what a short sale is. So those three bullet points that we looked at, um, the purchase price isn't enough to pay the cost of sale, the seller doesn't have sufficient liquid assets, and the lien holders agree to release their funds, to release what their, their liens. And then the short sale addendum has risks to buyer and seller. Um, everybody needs to understand that a lien holder isn't required or obligated to approve a short sale. So just because you have a contract doesn't mean you have a guarantee that you're going to get to buy this house, right? We have to have everybody's approval before we can proceed. Um, lien holders may require some terms to be amended. An amendment is what? A change. So lien holders may require some terms to be amended, but if they do require an amendment, buyer and seller are not obligated to agree to any of the lien holders proposed terms. So the lien holders may get the contract and say, no, 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 we're not going to do this. We're going to do that instead. And now buyer and seller have to agree to those changes before we can proceed. Um, seller may not be financially to make any repairs. All homes are as is anyway, right? But the buyer needs to understand that the seller may not be allowed to make repairs. Put yourself in the lien holder's shoes. If you owe them money and they find out you agreed to do $3,000 worth of repairs, are they happy? No, because in the lien holder's mind, they're going, that money should go in my pocket, not on the repairs. You guys with me? So the seller may not be allowed to do any repairs, um, if there's a due diligence or due diligence fee, it's usually not refundable to the buyer. I would suggest going heavy on earnest money, trying to get your buyer as little due diligence as possible because there is no guarantee I can get it back for them if we don't get the lien holder's approval. Um, lien holder's approval may take several weeks or more likely months to obtain and neither the seller nor their agent can guarantee the timeliness of the lien holders review. So just warned, caution that we're looking at a long time. And then neither the buyer, the seller, closing attorney, nor the brokers in the transaction have any control over lien holders approval or any act omission decision by the lien holders. Again, you guys, the name of the game is patience. Once this is sent to the lien holders for their approval, we just sit and wait. And one day your phone's gonna ring and you're gonna find out if you get approval or not. 
Is your phone going to ring in four months? Is it going to ring in 11 and a half months? It just depends. They say on average six months. What does average mean? It could be more, it could be less. The short sale addendum creates a contingency. The contingency says, the contingency is for the seller. And the contingency says, I can't sell my house if I don't get the lien holders approval. So how can I sell my house? Only if I get the lien holders approval. Um, either party can terminate until we have approval. So if the buyer's tired of waiting, for example, they can terminate and they will get their earnest money back. So I'm not gonna lie, a couple of times in our 11 and a half month one, I was like, hey, this cute house came on the market. Y'all wanna go see it? <laughs> and we did go look at other properties as well during that time. They really wanted that house. But what if they found another one? We could have terminated that contract, gotten their earnest money back and got them moved forward on another one. So nobody's locked in until we get the lien holders approval. The seller could go into foreclosure while we're waiting on the lien holders approval. There are no guarantees while we're waiting. Okay. Um, this form has to address the dates. Since I don't know how long it's going to take before we get lien holders approval, I can't put a due diligence date in. I can't put a closing date in. All we can say is so many days after we get approval. That's when the buyer's work starts is once we get approval. Then they can start their due diligence, loan approval, that kind of thing. But instead of putting dates, uh, we're just going to use like, for example, due diligence shall extend through 5 p.m. on the 15th date of from following delivery. So we get notice of acceptance from the lien holders, due diligence starts. Does that make sense? Since I don't know that date, I can't give you a date. I can just say 15 days or whatever we agree to. Lien holders can review as many contracts as we have. We could have multiple contracts. Did you hear me? I did not just say offers. We could have multiple contracts. So if there's one contract in the lien holder's hand, and another offer comes in, the seller has to negotiate it. If we go under contract with that one, we now have two contracts for the lien holders to review. They can only approve one, but they can have multiple contracts to consider. And through the eyes of the lien holders, which one are they gonna take? The one that costs them the less money, right? The one that has them lose the lease. So real estate commission requires offers from buyers received by the seller to be presented to the seller. We present what offers? All of them, even if we're under contract. Uh, the commission also requires the seller's agent um, to inform lien holders of all offers and contracts. The lien holders need to take everything into consideration that they can. Um, seller represents that there is or is not an existing contract. Other offers from buyers may be accepted and become a contract. Um, again, the lien holder can only approve one. While this is going on, the seller could potentially enter into foreclosure. They could enter into bankruptcy. There's a lot of uncertainty with short sales. Are we getting that? There's no guarantee with a short sale. And then the last page of this is notice of approval to short sale. So once we have all the lien holders permission, the seller notifies the buyer in writing and we have a page for them to do that. Then and only then can we proceed with the transaction. Once we have all the lien holders permission. So let's see. So the lien holders even after, well, they're not getting paid yet. They're just reviewing the contract to see what they're gonna get. They're releasing the lien at a loss and they have to agree to do that. They have to agree to release the lien with less than what they're owed. And that's why they can't make a decision until they have a contract in their hand. 
Um, hire commission to get for all this work. <laughs> no, no. And I was just getting ready to say, <laughs> our commission may be compromised. The lien holders could come in and say, the seller can't pay you that much. So our commission could be compromised. So you might get less than. Both of my short sales, I was lucky and I got what my firm considered a full commission, but that was part of the lien holders to take into consideration. Because remember the seller pays the commission. So the lien holders are gonna go, whoa, 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 whoa. Why are you paying all these agents when you owe me money, right? Can you see their dilemma? So guys, I'm not gonna lie. My 11 and a half month short sale, the listing agent, her email signature boasted herself as a foreclosure and short sale expert. By the way, that's a heck of a way to make a living. But my 11 and a half month, the agent knew what she was doing. And I can't tell you, even though it was that long, I cannot tell you how much easier she made the process because she knew what to do. She knew who to contact. She knew how to navigate this thing. If you ever get called to list a home that's a potential short sale, get your seller's attorney involved and get your seller's accountant involved. It got out of your realm, okay? So if you're ever called to list a potential short sale, you got to bring in reinforcements. You got to bring in the attorney. You got to bring in some experts to best protect your seller. There's a lot of uncertainty in these things. There is no guarantee. Like I said, in my 11 and a half month, I tried on numerous occasions to get my buyers to look at something else, but they really, really, really wanted that house. And by the way, these are really good friends of mine, like really, really good friends of mine. So that made it interesting too. We'd go to dinner and they'd pit their like seven-year-old daughter on me. Aunt Julie, when are we going to get our house? I'm like, oh, y'all stop it. <laughs> you know, Aunt Julie has nothing to do with this. And you know that. <laughs> but they put their kid on me, y'all. <laughs> They're still in that house. They joke every once in a while about selling. I'm like, no, 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 no. We all work too hard for this house. You are not selling. They really wanted the house and they got a good deal. They just had to be patient. The name of the game is patience. Other questions on a short sale? Again, when this market swings back and we start seeing more of these, you'll see training in your firm. Um, when we start first started dealing with these in the housing market crash, my firm actually had an attorney come in and talk to us about it. So there will be more training and stuff that come in. Because back in 2008, we were like a short, what? What did you call that? You know, so it was brand new to us. But with the housing market crash, we saw a lot. I don't think we're going to see as many, but I do think we're going to have some kind of dip that's going to result in foreclosures and short sales. So stay tuned for that. Okay, I'm gonna go off textbook for a second because we're gonna talk about um, the sale of mortgage property. How does the seller sell the home when they have a mortgage? And I need to go off textbook for something. I don't know why the textbook doesn't cover this, but they don't, so I need to. The most common way for a seller to sell a property that they owe money on is by going through a cash sale. And what a cash sale says is at closing, the seller is going to use the proceeds from the sale to pay off their mortgage. So before the seller gets paid, they pay off their mortgage. Why is that not mentioned in the book? This is what we deal with 95% of the time. I just made that number up. But this is what we deal with most of the time. Patience, lots and lots of patience. So again, the proceeds from the sale, before the seller gets paid, they pay off their mortgage. They have a lump sum due in full that gets paid off, that clears that lien, and then the seller is free to transfer a clear marketable title and the seller gets paid whatever's left. The seller is the very last one in line. I need everybody to understand that as well. The seller is the very last one in line. 
And the only way the seller is going to get paid is when everybody else in front of them, including me and you, we're in that line as well at some point. Once everybody else gets paid, then the seller's proceeds are what's left. The seller could also sell their mortgage property subject to the mortgage. Subject to the mortgage means, this is really rare, but subject to the mortgage says the seller is going to basically give the buyer their loan, but the seller is going to keep all the liability. So in other words, if the buyer defaults, if the new borrower defaults, who are they going to go after? The seller. Do we see why this is rare? Would you do this? Every single one of you shake your head no. <laughs> this is really rare. Somebody else is gonna take over my loan. I want them to be responsible for them, right? So subject to the mortgage is awfully rare. Something else we may see, and I predict we're gonna see more of these as well. The buyer could assume the seller's mortgage. And I'll tell you why I have my prediction in just a second. In the event of the buyer assuming the seller's mortgage, the lender in the event of default is gonna go after the borrower first, but if they can't get the money from the borrower, they still may be able to go after the seller, the previous owner. So both are still liable. Why do I think we're gonna see more of these? Why are we gonna see more of the buyer assuming the seller's loan? Well, first off, let's talk about what this means in numbers. You're buying a house with a $100,000 purchase price. The seller has a $50,000 loan. If the buyer assumes the seller's loan, the buyer is taking on that $50,000 obligation. The buyer has to get approval from the lender. Right. They got to go through the process and make sure they qualify, make sure that they are um, that they can take on that fifty thousand dollar loan. Um, are the terms going to change? Is the interest rate going to change? It just depends. It depends on the term of the loan. But the buyer is taking over that liability of fifty thousand dollars. But how much do they owe the seller? They owe the seller one hundred thousand. So if they're taking over fifty thousand dollars then that means at settlement, the buyer has to bring the seller $50,000. So they're paying the seller by bringing them money and by assuming their loan, by taking their loan. Why do I expect this in the future? Why do I expect us to see more of these in the future? Last year, we had home loans being originated at historically low interest rates, 2%, 3% interest rates. And if the buyer is assuming the seller's mortgage, they're taking on that responsibility. Let's say you bought a house last year and you got a 3% interest rate. Interest rates are already starting to climb. They hit 5% a week or so ago, which by the way, 5% is not bad. Let me just say that. My parents bought their house in 1995 and they had like a 13% interest rate. So 5% is not bad. If I allow you to assume my mortgage at a 3% interest rate and the house across the street from me goes up for sale where the buyer has to originate a new loan at a 5% interest rate, which one is the buyer going to be more apt to go to? They want to take advantage of my 3%, assuming they got that $50,000 in, in the bank, right? So I think, another prediction, and just that, I think we're going to see more buyers assuming seller mortgages as we start seeing these interest rates. I don't think we're going to leave 5% this year. I don't think we're going to leave 5% next year. I think it's going to take us a while. But guys, the difference in a 5% interest rate and a 3% interest rate could be a couple hundred dollars a month, right? Depending on your, your purchase price, your loan amount. So it could be the difference in assuming the loan or originating the new. So assuming the loan, the liability may be on both. The lender will go after the, the buyer, the new owner first in the event of default, but the seller isn't completely relieved of all obligations. Again, I'm gonna go back for one second. 
what do we see the majority of the time? And I think we will see this most of the time is that cash sale. Seller pays it off, buyer originates a new loan. Questions? I thought, I thought you always had to do that when you always had to pay your loan off like that previous slide you were just on. I thought if that- If we're doing a cash uh, sale, maybe we're doing a subject to the mortgage or assuming a seller's mortgage. So we have options. And this is just in the short sale scenario we're speaking? No, we're, no, we're, no. This is just how the seller can sell their mortgage property. Okay. What we see most is a cash sale. Seller pays it off, buyer originates a new loan. We're just yeah. letting you know that okay. they have other ways they can do this, as long as the parties okay. agree and the lender still has to approve the buyer. The buyer still has to get loan approval. So it's not just anybody can do this, right? You still have to qualify for that loan. Um, okay, so a cash sale, let's say your purchase price is $100,000 and you've paid it off and you now owe $40,000. That means you have $60,000 to play with, right? You got to pay that $40,000 to the lender. You pay that $60,000, you have, you know, commission and excise tax and deed preparation and all those other fees that sellers have to pay. So they get whatever's left. We're going to talk about how sellers get paid at closing and how buyers get paid at closing or what buyers have to bring to closing, I should say, in unit 21. So we'll talk a little bit more about this. Sellers in a cash sale have to pay off all of their outstanding liens. Guys, remember, specific liens attached to the property. So if the seller doesn't pay them off, the seller's not taking them with them, are they? They're staying on the property. So the buyer wants to buy knowing that they're starting with a clean slate. So with the cash sale, the seller pays everything off, the buyer originates a new loan, and starts with the with scratch. Other questions? We've talked about the deed of trust. Again, it's fancy in North Carolina, our deed of trust is the mortgage. Let's talk a little bit more about the promissory note. The promissory note is the IOU. The promissory note is the agreement between the lender and the borrower. I owe you X amount every month for the next however many months. The promissory note is not recorded. Not recorded. It's the deed of trust that gets recorded. And there are some essential elements, essential ingredients of a valid promissory note. The promissory note has to list out the terms. How much debt are we talking about? How long do you have to pay it back? Is it a 15 year loan, a 20 year loan, a 30 year loan? It's an IOU, so it's a promise to pay that's signed by the borrower. The borrower is promising to pay the lender back under these terms. Think of the promissory note as the contract, the, the, the bilateral agreement between the lender and the borrower. If the promissory note is a negotiable instrument, then that means the lender has the right to sell the loan. The lender has the right to service the loan. Not all loans are serviceable. Some lenders keep their loans in-house and service them themselves. Again, my homeowner's on the call. You bought a house probably within a week, maybe two, you're gonna get a letter 
for the most part that says, hey, we've sold your new loan. And you think, well, dang, they just originated it a week ago. Why are they already selling it? We're going to talk about why they do that on Tuesday. We'll talk more about that when we get into Unit 15. But whether or not the note can be serviced, whether or not can be sold, a negotiable instrument can be, so then non-negotiable can't be serviced. They don't have the right to sell it. There's some terms involved with the promissory note. The acceleration clause. The acceleration clause says if the borrower defaults, the lender has the right to accelerate the maturity of the loan. If the borrower defaults, the lender can say the whole note is due now. They can accelerate when it's due. In other words, they can make it payable immediately. If you don't pay me now, we're going to foreclose. The promissory note may or may not have a prepayment penalty. A prepayment penalty says you're going to be charged a penalty if you pay it off early. Whether or not yours has a prepayment penalty after class, you know that when you go come back from closing and you got a stack of paperwork from the attorney, maybe it's in an envelope, maybe it's on a thumb drive, and you put it in a file cabinet never to be seen again, you got some good stuff in there, one of them being a promissory note. Next week in Unit 15, we're going to talk about the different loan types. And one thing we're going to learn, FHA loans and VA loans cannot have a prepayment penalty. FHA and VA cannot have a prepayment penalty. Conventional loans of $150,000 or less cannot have a prepayment penalty. So basically, if you're looking at a prepayment penalty, it's non or it's a conventional loan, $150,000 or more. We'll talk about the different loan types next week. Another provision in the promissory note is the due on sale clause. The due on sale clause is the cash sale that we were just referring to. And the due on sale clause says, when is the entire note due? It's due on the sale of the property. So if you sell your property and you still owe the lender, essentially you're enacting the acceleration clause and the whole note is due when you sell, due on sale. When's it due? When you sell it. That's that cash sale that we were just talking about. That's also referred to as the alienation clause. Again, these are all provisions spelled out in your uh, promissory note and the agreement between the lender and the borrower. My screen just did that again. Are we here? So let's look at an example together. A bank loaned Roy, a home purchaser, $350,000 at 4% interest rate, repayable in monthly installments for 30 years. Several years later, Roy defaulted by missing four payments, and he still owed the bank $338,000. The bank set notice of default. The bank gave Roy an opportunity to catch up on missing payments, but oh, Roy, he didn't respond. The bank initiated the acceleration clause. Basically, what the bank said is, if Roy, if you don't pay us $338,000, you're out. They accelerated when it was due because of Roy's default. That's what the acceleration clause do. It accelerates when it's due. He no longer has that, what's he down to, 26 years. He's got to come up with the 338. Now, 
or they'll foreclose. So basically what they do is they remove the most, the monthly installments and he just has to pay the entire amount, right? If you default, or he's out. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And the reason they're making him pay the whole amount is because they sent him notice, they gave him an opportunity, and he just said, whatever, I'm going to ignore you. They try. I mean, let's be fair to the lender here, right? They try. Guys, lenders don't want to go into foreclosure. It costs them time and money. If they can work with the borrower, they'd rather do that. Um, I've talked to several homeowners in my time that are in danger of foreclosure or short sale, and they're too embarrassed to call the lender. They, you know, that's got to be a hard call to make. But if you can pick up the phone and call the lender, I think for the most part, now I'm not a lender and I'm not all the lenders, but I think for the most part, the lender is going to be more apt to try to work with you than foreclose on you. So if you call the lender and say, medical issues or for whatever reason I'm struggling, they might work with you for a couple months, maybe reduce your payment for a few months to help you get caught up, right? But if you ignore them, they're gonna say, fine, we tried, you owe me $338,000. Lenders don't want to foreclose. Lenders have to foreclose. Does that make sense? Again, I don't know why lenders get the bad rap. If you owe me $338,000, I'm taking action on you as well. Fair enough. I don't know where I'm getting that kind of money once again, but we'll cross that bridge later. The lenders are just investors. They got to protect their money. They got to protect their investment. Hey, Julie, I have a question about the due on sale clause. Mm -hmm. um, it states that um, declaring the entire debt to be due and payable immediately or permitting the buyer to assume the loan at current market interest rates. Would that clause be put in to negate the buying subject to or assuming a seller's mortgage? Um, they may, they may do that. They may, if they're gonna allow it to be subject to or to be assumed, it should be spelled out in the promissory note. So they're gonna specify what that due on sale clause, you know, is it due on the sale or is it due, you know, like in cash on sale or is it due by this buyer assuming the seller's loan? So it needs to specify. Thank you. Yep, sure. And this is where I guess it can get tricky because every single lender is different, right? Kind of like real estate agents and real estate firms, right? They're, they're all different. Yes, they have rules and guidelines that they have to follow too. How many of you read your promissory note before you signed it and bought your house? Yeah, I didn't either. So, you know, and that's where we as the consumer need to do a better job. Let's face it. All right, bottom of page 373, let's define some more words. <clears throat> Principal is the amount of money that you borrowed from the bank. When you went into the bank and said, give me $90,000, that's your principal. Interest is what the bank charges you when they gave you that principal. Interest is what the bank charges you to borrow that money. The principal and the interest together equal what's known to as debt service. Principal and interest are the borrower's debt service. The debt service is what you owe the bank. Debt service is what you owe the bank. Guys, it is way too easy to ask you about principal and interest on your test. What do you think they're gonna ask you about? Debt service. Debt service is principal and interest. When we come in on Tuesday, I'm gonna ask you guys what debt service is. And I want every single one of you to say P and I.
your payment consists of four parts. The four parts of your payment are your PITI. Some of you like to call it your PITI. PITI stands for principal and interest, taxes, and insurance. Your PITI is your principal and interest, your debt service that you owe the bank, a 12th of your annual real property taxes and a 12th of your annual homeowner's insurance. Remember, the lender is collecting taxes and insurance from you throughout the year. So when those bills come due, they can pay those bills on your behalf. We'll talk more about that in just a second. So your debt service is what you owe the bank. When you send that money in every month, you're sending in your pity your debt service, plus your taxes and insurance. Amortization is taking a loan and breaking it down into regular level payments. Your debt service is the same every single month. Month one, month two, month 20, month 180, your debt service is the same every single month. And what an amortized loan says is that you make that debt service, that principal and interest payment in equal payments to pay down the loan. What changes every month is how much is applied to principal and how much is applied to interest. When you originate a home loan, You start, your debt service starts, you pay a little bit of principal and a whole lot of interest. And as time goes on, you pay more and more principal and less and less interest. You're still paying the same every month, but what varies is how much is applied. There's a great picture in your book on page 374 of a level payment amortized loan, 374. You see those bars, some are, the top parts are light gray, the bottom parts are dark gray, but you see those bars are the same, it's level. That represents your payment. The principal is the light gray, the interest is the dark gray. You're still paying the same every month, but it's how much is applied to principal, how much is applied to interest. Again, homeowners, you know, sometimes your mortgage payment changes. Sometimes it goes up. I guess sometimes it could go down. What changes your mortgage payment are your taxes and insurance. As taxes go up, as homeowners insurance goes up, that changes your payment. Your principal and interest, your debt service stays the same throughout the life of the loan. So here's a picture of our pity. The principal is the money that goes towards your house. It's the money that you borrowed and the payment goes to your house. The interest is the money you pay that goes to the bank for borrowing that money. The bank charges you to borrow money. That's what the interest rate is. And then taxes and insurance, a 12th of annual taxes and a 12th of annual homeowner's insurance goes into an escrow account. The lender holds on to that money on your behalf until those bills come due. And then they pay those bills on your behalf, not to be nice to you, but to protect their interest. They do not want Forsyth County foreclosing on you because you didn't feel like paying taxes. So your mortgage payment is your debt service and your taxes and your insurance. Debt service stays the same. Everybody good with that? Debt service is the same on month one for the next 30 years or 15 years or 10 years, however long you have the loan.
with your debt service, interest is payable in arrears. When you make your mortgage payment, when you made your mortgage payment on April 1st, you paid March's interest. Whenever you make your mortgage payment, you're paying interest for the month behind you. Interest is paid in arrears. Everybody stop and look with me real quick. Where is your rear? Your rear is behind you. So when you make your mortgage payment, you make the payment on May 1st, you're paying April's interest. When you make the payment on June 1st, you're paying May's interest. When you make that payment, you're always looking in the month behind you where your rear is. Amortized loans are what we're gonna deal with. Again, equal payments. A fully amortized loan means when you make your last payment, your balance is zero. You have fully amortized the loan. A partially amortized loan means when you make your last payment, you still have an amount due. And that amount due is referred to as your balloon payment. You knew that going into it, part of your promissory note, part of your discussion with the lender if you didn't read your promissory note. So you make all these payments, you make your very last amortized payment, and you still have a balance due. That's a partially amortized loan. And while not all lenders do it, but most, set up an escrow account for borrowers to collect a 12th of taxes and a 12th of insurance so they can pay those bills on your behalf. The taxes and the insurance, the TI of the PITI is what adjusts your monthly payment. So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna end here. We'll start here on Tuesday. Um, we're gonna get a little started on the math. Again, you guys, please let me stress, next week is a heavy math week. Look ahead, look at the math concepts in 14 and 15. We're gonna get a little started on the math today though. So we'll be able to start here. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna give you guys three formulas and I want you to take a fast minute and write this down. Write down your three formulas and then we're gonna talk about them. These three formulas can also be referred to as three steps. Every month that we amortize a loan, we need to do these three steps. So the first month, we have to find the monthly interest, the monthly principal, and next month's balance. And to amortize a loan, you do these three steps for the life of the loan. Is it a 30 year loan, a 15 year loan, whatever? Any one of these could be a good candidate for your exam. So you need to know the formula to find monthly interest. You need to know the formula to find the monthly principal. You need to know the formula to find next month's balance. 
the three together will allow us to amortize a loan monthly. So three formulas, three steps, however you want to, want to think about it. You guys have these written down? I don't have a T-bar for these yet. <laughs> um, so these are just three formulas that you just have to know. How do we memorize formulas? Put them on a flashcard. If you don't know the formula, you don't know how to amortize a loan. Everybody with me? So half the bat, no, over half the battle, 60% of the battle is knowing the formula. So memorize, repeat it, write it over and over and over again, put on a flashcard, I don't care. So let's look at how we would amortize a loan. So we are told that your buyer's approved for a $100,000 loan at a 5% interest rate for 30 years. Their monthly principal and interest payment is $499.55, and we're asked to find the balance of the loan after the first month's payment. When I amortize, I'm a pretty ducks in a row kind of kind of person so I like my dots lined up and equal distance apart and you know so I like rows and columns I like to be able to see what it is that I'm looking at and when I amortize the first thing I do is start stop and set myself up with nice neat rows and columns so I can see what I'm working with so we got our monthly and oh, and th we got our monthly payment We got our monthly interest. We got our monthly principal. And then we have our balance. Our balance is what we owe the bank. And when you're amortizing a loan, we're gonna look at month one, month two, month three, and so on for the life of the loan. So a 30 year loan is how many months? How many months are in a year? 12. So if you take 30 times 12, you're gonna get 360. So a 30 year loan is 360 months. Everybody with me so far? The year times 12 tells you how many months. Your debt service is your principal and interest is also your monthly payment to the bank. And your debt service is the same every single month. Month one, it's $499.55. Month two, it's $499.55. Month 143, it's $499.55. Month 360, it's $499.55. Your monthly payment is your debt service, is your principal and interest, and is the same for the life of the loan. Your first month, the balance is your loan amount. You owe the bank what you borrow, yes? You walked into the bank, you said, give me $100,000, you close on the property, your balance is now how much you owe the bank. Your interest rate is 5%. This is all the information you need to amortize this loan for the next 360 months. Homeowners, packet that you got from the closing attorney that you never looked at. Also within that packet is your amortized schedule. It amortized your loan for for example, 360 months. You can see the breakdown. So now we're gonna apply, because now we need to figure out on month one, how much is applied to principal and how much is applied to interest. And how much of that is gonna reduce my balance going into month two. So now we're gonna look at our three steps. So the first step says that we have to find monthly interest. How do we find monthly interest? You take the balance times the interest rate, the balance times the interest rate gives you annual interest. I don't want annual interest though. I want monthly. How do I convert annual to monthly? Our formula tells us to divide by 12. 
which means my first month's monthly interest is going to be $416.67. Of my first month's payment of $499.55, $416.67 is going to be applied to interest. $416.67 goes to the bank. That's step one, monthly interest. Step two is to find our monthly principal. Principal plus interest equals our monthly payment. So how do I find my first month's monthly principal? I take my payment amount, this is step two. Take my payment amount minus my interest and I get my first month's principal of $82.88. This is a great place to stop and check yourself. Does 82.88 plus 416.67 equal 499.55? So the first month I took that payment of 499.55 and I divvied it up in this manner. 416.67 went to the bank, 82.88 went to the principal, went to me, basically made a payment to myself for my home, for my property. The third step is to find my balance going into the second month. Principal reduces balance. So for the third step, you take your balance, Minus your principal. So for the third step, I get a balance going into month two, 100,000 minus 82.88. I now only owe the bank $99,917.12. We just amortized our loan for the first month. To amortize my loan for the second month, I do those three steps again. I start with my balance of 99, 9, 17, 12, and we go through those three steps again. I'm getting ready to show you guys an amortization schedule that you can look at this weekend. This is how, and again, we're getting ready to see it. I want you to make sure you guys have everything written down because I'm getting ready to go away and I'm watching my time. I really am. So is everybody good? Can I erase what I have? Speak now, please, because it's getting ready to go away. Everybody good? Okay, so let's see what, we, what we're doing here. Let's kind of step back and look at the big picture. And we'll pick back up here on, on Thursday. We'll start here on Thursday. But if we look at the big picture, if we go into Learn Test Pass in the Unit 1415 material, I have a practice amortization. This is the same problem that we just started. So what we just did together in class was month one. We just did month one. And we said we have a balance of $99,917.12. So to amortize for month two, we take that balance times the interest rate, divide by 12 to get monthly interest, payment minus interest equals principal, balance minus principal. You guys see what we're doing? Those three steps over and over and over every single month. Notice on this amortization schedule, you see how interest goes down a teeny tiny bit every month and principal goes up a teeny tiny bit every month. That's back to our picture on page 374. My monthly payment stayed the same every single month. What changes is how much I owe in interest and how much I owe in principal. And as time goes on, I'm going to pay less and less interest and more and more principal. This is not set up on accident. The bank is making sure that they get paid first. If you demand $100,000, if you wanna borrow $100,000, the bank wants to make sure 
they get paid first. Guys, we don't own homes as long as what we used to. You know, many, many years ago, our grandparents, maybe our great grandparents, you bought a home and you were there for 30, 50 years, right? You died in that home. Today, on average in America, we sell our home every eight to nine years. So the lender wants to make sure that they get paid. <laughs> and yes, it's a lot of interest, but you borrowed $100,000. $100,000 is a lot of money. So why wouldn't the bank collect their interest? But as time goes on, they're collecting less and less interest and you have more and more principal. That's how you build equity into your home. You pay the bank off and then you start applying that principal to you, to your home. We'll talk about equity, future units. You guys have this and learn test pass. This is a great way to practice doing those three steps. I only did the first year for you guys, but I promise you, if you uh, amortize this thing, if you do those three steps four or five or eight times, you'll be able to spit this problem out. For your test, they're not gonna go much past the first or the second month for timing. So if you get this test question, they may ask you what the first month's monthly interest is, what the first month's monthly principal is, or what the balance is after making the first payment. So that's why knowing all three of those steps, all three of those formulas, that's all you need to know to amortize this thing for 360 months. So use this as a guide, go find your amortization schedule in your file cabinet if you're a homeowner and you can figure it out too. But if you do those three steps over and over and over again, it's gonna be repetitive and you'll be able to get through this problem quick and move on. Okay, we'll start here on Tuesday. Uh, next week, we'll finish 14. We'll finish, get through unit 15. We'll probably even get started on unit 21. So if you're looking ahead, 14, 15, and 21, hang on to your hats. We got to keep moving. If you have questions, let me know. I would love to hear from you guys this weekend. Uh, called a midterm recap how you're doing how you're feeling where you are i'd love to hear from you guys otherwise you guys have a great weekend and i will see you when tuesday morning at nine o'clock